Welcome to the podcast. It's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. The Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee, joined by an awesome crew here today. We have Pivot Cycles and DT Swiss's Hannah Otto. Hi, everyone. And Hand Up Plus the Black Bibs Racing's Ivy Audrain. Hey, how's it going? And we also have our head coach, Chad Zimmerman. Hi, everybody. Good to have you, Chad. Yes, uh, good to be we here. were going to get two weeks in a row with you, but then we made a scheduling snafu. So next week you won't be with us. So we're going to like, just, we're going to squeeze the juice. We got Chad this week. It's going to be a good one. <laughs> Too um, Bring yeah. joy. <laughs> That's it. Uh, you can submit your questions and they're the ones that we're going to answer today. Well, I mean, not the ones that you're submitting now because that would be future and this is past, but Hey, just the same. You can submit your questions at trainerroadcom slash podcast. That's where we will Come through questions every week and answer them. And if you're listening to this podcast, joining us on YouTube right now, give it a thumbs up. If you're listening, share the podcast with your friends and rate it on Spotify. That's a huge need for us. And it really helps the podcast. So sharing it with everybody, that's the thing to do. Uh, before we get into any, or before we, we're going to throw everything aside and just jump straight into questions today. And this first one comes from William. His, uh, he says, help me understand warm up requirements and the performance throughout a ride. I feel like I need about an hour before I can perform properly. Early efforts feel terrible and make me want to quit. While later during comp or comparable efforts, I enjoy pushing harder and farther. The people I ride with seem to be much more consistent in their performance, usually outperforming me in the beginning and keeping the same level throughout the ride, only dropping off toward the end when exhausted. Whereas I seem to struggle at first, often holding the others back. Then it evens out and towards the end, I can often impress them with my efforts. So I paraphrase, where do you find a paraphrase? Where do you find the strength and energy at this point? That's what they're asking him. <clears throat> he says, and they don't do anything different, different than me. The difference is at most 10 minutes of riding to their pace or, or to their place or mine. So what could be the cause of this? Could it be physiological? I've done many years of strength training before starting cycling more seriously. So could it be explained by my muscle mass and muscle fiber type? What else could it be? Do you have any similar experiences yourself or with other riders? What can I do to improve this? Even if it's just a social ride, it does suck to be barely holding on for the first hour and simply adding an hour at the beginning of each ride isn't really practical. Uh, this is, we have a lot of fodder, whether it's personal experience, whether they're talking about warmups and the science behind warmups, lots of stuff to go through with this, but Ivy, you've done a ton of different types of racing, like track racing. So there's this old adage where it's like shorter event, longer the warmup longer event, shorter the warm-up, like where they're inversely related. That's an mm -hmm. adage that isn't scientific. <clears throat> That's just like what we hear people say, and you have tested the extremes of that because <laughs> you have done long world tour level, level pro road races, and then you've done track racing where you just stand and sprint for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed something like this before where it takes you a long time to warm up, whether it's in you or other riders? Yeah, I've definitely raced with and ridden with people that say this and believe this, that they take longer to warm up and get so trapped in it that it sometimes mm -hmm. maybe like William is experiencing kind of wrecks their ride or race because they get trapped in the mindset that they take so long to warm up. And the thing that stuck out to me about what William said is that the people they ride with outperform in the beginning and stay stronger. I don't know that that's necessarily true. Maybe the people that William is riding with just isn't waiting to feel absolutely perfect. You know, mm. I think William might be, and that's kind of what I've experienced with people that believe that they need a really long time to warm up. They usually don't, they're just waiting to feel just right and perfect. And everyone around them feels the same way, but they're just, you know, they're not warmed up yet either but they're just not waiting to, uh, feel just right. And they may be able to get into that effort a little bit better because they're not trapped in that mindset of thinking they need more time, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Hannah, how about you? Uh, like, does this, does any of this resonate with you? Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like, I do feel like I need a little bit longer warm up, maybe than some people. Um, but definitely not an hour. So I think there's, there's a point of diminishing returns in this, where I completely agree with Ivy. What Ivy's saying is at a certain point, you're no longer warming up. You're just waiting to feel perfect. And that moment may or may not ever come. And so I think really you <laughs> need to understand. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And so I think, you know, what this individual needs to understand is 
what the main goals of warming up are. And once that individual has achieved those goals, it's time to just move forward regardless of what they feel like. Mm. Yeah. And Chad, this is, this has got to like strike chords with you uh, because there are a lot of different questions in this that he's asked. Um, there's also some assumptions in place. Uh, where do you want to start with addressing this question? Then we'll get into more some like some practical things of what each of us do to warm up and sure. we can take that discussion. Yeah, and Hannah just set this up really well too. And we'll get to what her warm up is because when we were discussing this prior in our planning meeting, she said so many things that hit on a lot of scientific points that I'll cover. So uh, we'll get to that. But William, I, I want to express a little bit of uh, I, I kind of relate to you because I mean, we just dove right into this. Typically we have a bit of preamble and we talk about a whole bunch of things and I can settle into a more relaxed groove and there's no warm up today. We're doing John this. Said no. <laughs> so the bear gun. with us. First slap yeah. attack. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Okay. So uh, let, let's just cover what, what Hannah alluded to that the purported purposes are really the benefits of warming up. And then we can maybe piece together why it's such a struggle for, for William, or maybe why it shouldn't be. Uh, first off, you know, physiologically, there are a number of things we're trying to achieve, and largely we want to increase boss, uh, body muscle temperature. So you can call it body temp, but really we're trying to heat the muscles. There are other things that are going to heat with it, but um, a number of studies will, will ha have touted, and it, it is a clear scientific consensus. It's uh, about a degree Celsius increase in muscle temperature can yield improvements in performance. And they, and they can pin that to a number. I see 2% up to 5%, depending on whatever aspect of exercise performance they're measuring. And there's also a muscle temperature response that positively relates to the movement velocity. So to put that less scientifically, it's high speed movements are, are tied to warming and that ties to improvement performance. So there's a reason we do or recommend quick leg spinning at the start of every workout. So there's a velocity related aspect to that. And the same can be said about the work rate or in our parlance, the intensity. So, you know, the, 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 the takeaway here is that all of this so far supports the inclusion of both quick spinning and a little bit of hard work when you're warming up. And this makes sense in, in, in most cases, we'll get to the simplicity of, of all of this a little bit later. And, and then also interestingly, the higher the intensity of the warm up, the longer lasting the warming effects. And that's, uh, th that's something I, I kind of want to address a little bit. Uh, just ahead here, but, uh, and, and I do recognize that it's not always desirable to, to warm to, to this point because we can decrease our, our heat storage capacity. I mean, on a hot day, warming up in the direct sun prior to a criterion where you're going <laughs> to be, be hot from lap one, probably not a good idea. So warm ups do need to be tempered with good judgment. I mean, it can't all be reduced to science. I, I can, but I mean, you don't even have to consider the science, just recognize that if you go in hot, you're going to stay hot and you're probably going to get hotter. Okay. Another benefit or a purported one, and actually a measured one or a research based or evidence-based one is to elevate base, baseline VO2. So our oxygen uptake, we want to raise that prior to engaging in whatever our, our, our event or race or workout is for a number of reasons. First of which is we want to improve those VO2 kinetics that we've discussed in the past. And, and to put it really simply, it's just faster oxygen response. You know, you work harder, you need more oxygen, you work less, you need less oxygen. How quickly do those kinetics change? Secondly, by elevating that, that baseline VO2, bringing your oxygen uptake up prior to, to whatever you're going to do, we can actually reduce that VO2 slow component that we've also discussed. So, you know, over time that inexorable crawl toward not really failure, but definitely diminished performance and more labored, you know, just higher RPE, just, just harder work. We could actually affect that positively by warming up. And then, and we've talked about this a number of times, and I think this is probably the most obvious one is, is we can uh, decrease our reliance on glycogen early in a workout or race. And the idea being that if, if more oxygen is being consumed, then we're making better use of our aerobic metabolism, which means we're tapping our anaerobic stores less. And I say all this, but this all assumes that the warm up was intense enough. And, and Hannah already touched on this, I think, and we're going to talk more about it, but passively noodling on your bike is not the same thing as a structured work or a structured <laughs> warm up where you include fast pedaling and, and, and efforts that are above your FTP. And it also assumes, and this is very important that it's not followed by too long a duration of a transition. You can't warm up and then go race 30 minutes later and expect to uh, benefit from any of the, <clears throat> any, any of the things I just described. 
And a lot of the studies, quite a lot of the studies pin that at about 10 minutes. And it's a really narrow range. I, I saw the high end being nine to 10 minutes. One study looked at nine, everyone else seemed to agree on 10 minutes. It's a round figure, but if you do your warm up, do your best to get to the line and get going within 10 minutes. If you want to fully benefit from, from a lot of the things I just described. And then there are some muscular benefits and um, I won't get deep in these, but improve muscle metabolism, which we kind of touched on with the aerobic anaerobic contributions, increase cross bridge cycling rate. And, and again, we could dive into what that is, but I don't think that's going to make anybody faster so much as what's important here is to understand that it's just better muscle function. Your muscles work better because they're warmer. Okay. And then you, know, you get a little more specific and prime your, your type two fibers, right? Your, your, your high force, low, uh, fatigue resistant fibers. If, you know, if you're going to use on that, if anything you're going to do is type two reliant, probably a good idea to wake those guys up. It's, it, it, I mean, if sprinting's part of your ride. It's, it's an obvious get, but any type of racing you do, it could be, you know, cross country, mountain bike, marathon, mountain bike, uh, even a time trial, if you're going to, uh, for whatever reason, attack short climbs. I mean, there are all sorts of use cases where it makes sense to do a little bit or a handful, I guess, of activation efforts. This does translate to improved performance measured, evidence-based improved performance. And then finally, it's kind of an outlier, uh, something I don't think people necessarily consider, but it can prime your respiratory muscles. And, and I leaned on a particular study that showed evidence that use of one of those inspiratory muscle devices. So, so an IMD actually improved 3,200 meter running time. And and, and it did so via enhancements in inspiratory muscle function. And I know that doesn't directly translate to what we're talking about here, but it does suggest that perhaps your inspiratory muscles bear a small influence. And I think that makes good reason. Those are muscles we heavily rely upon, especially if we're working hard. So why not kind of prime the pump? Yeah. So th this is a lot of like the physical goings on. Thank you so much, Chad. That was like a, a wonderful breakdown of what goes on inside our body when we warm up. We also have other episodes where we've talked about this. So if you search for ask a cycling coach podcast, warm up, you'll find the different times when we've mentioned this and Chad has gone, Chad just did a fantastic job of summarizing what he's gone into in a lot of depth in other episodes, which is fantastic. I want to focus in on this physical stuff and then go into the mental side of things thereafter. Chad, do you think it, it would it be okay if we went over Hannah's warm up and use that kind of as like a kickoff to talk about the physical things? Yeah, it's perfect because it, it kind of tees up a, a number of questions that I have for William. A number of questions I think we all have for William. Yeah, no doubt. Uh -huh. Hannah, what's your what's your typical warm up like? We can run through that, and then uh, the other question that I have with this is when do you change that and how do you change it depending on different circumstances? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... I'll do my best to just focus on the physical. Cause I feel like the mental is so intermixed with this as well, that, uh, I'm excited to talk about that too, but usually I just start with a super easy spin, um, where I just ask nothing of myself other than to turn over the pedals. And that's just going to last as long as I need it to, but probably no more than five minutes. And then I'll start an aerobic build, uh, which will lead into a short tempo effort, usually three to five minutes. Um, and then I'll do usually three high cadence spin ups, which I feel like really get, um, my respiratory rate up and get my muscles moving without overloading those muscles. That's the sensation that I have. And then I'll finish up with one race pace effort. So that's usually what I'm doing is I'm mimicking what I anticipate the first minute of the race to be. Um, and then I usually spin down a little bit. I actually cool down a little bit from that warm up so that I'm not just standing in the grid right after that hard race pace. Breathing heavy. Yeah. <laughs> like legs that feel like they're full of blood and stuff. Yeah. Um, can I ask you when you, when you're doing these high cadence spin ups that you do early on, uh, are you paying attention to power or are you more paying attention to just making sure that you are getting that neuromuscular coordination firing properly? Mostly just the neuromuscular coordination. Um, I'll look at the power just a little bit, but the range that I allow for this is more than 50 Watts. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I don't really have any expectation attached to that other than, you know, I'm not going to be below aerobic, you know, I'm not going to be in recovery type for that, but mostly what I'm looking at is being over 110 RPMs for those and still maintaining nice, good circles I and not do, bouncing you, on the saddle. Sorry, Hannah. Yeah. No, that's yeah. That's a good point too. Like, 
the, if the whole point is to build like proper firing patterns and coordination, you don't want to embrace bad technique, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Kick off the day. Yeah. Um, how about you, Ivy? You just raced a crit this past weekend, uh, something high intensity, relatively short compared to a lot of the different events that you've done. Uh, what, what's, what's your typical warm up like, or what sort of boxes do you like to check in a warm up beforehand? Well, from a structure standpoint, mine looks remarkably similar to Hannah's. And I laugh when, uh, she says she tries to emulate what the first, like what the beginning of the race looks like, because that's absolutely what I do. Like if I'm going to a road race, I'm not going to honestly, or a longer one, I'm not going to do much. Um, especially if I'm expecting a really kind of slow, chill start, I'll do some high cadence stuff. Um, if I'm, when I was doing track stuff, we would have like uh, a set of rollers on the rails, like next to the start line, because you want to do, be like warming up and warm all the time and be able to hop right onto the track. Um, before this weekend, I rode to the crit and did a lot of my warm up on the ride to the race. And um, I think the biggest mistake that I see a lot of people do when they are trying to warm up is do really, high intensity, like straight up sprinting, like mm -hmm. anaerobic, just striking a bunch of matches to think that they need to get their legs open and ready for that kind of effort. And it's super unnecessary. So it's hard to find a balance between making sure you like check all those boxes for those systems without burning a bunch of matches. Chad, is there like a, I mean, you've done TTs, crits, road races, mountain bike races across the board. What's do you, what sort of structure do you typically try to implement for a warm up? It, we, we touched on all of it. It, it yeah. super relates to, well, first the, the duration of the event. I mean, if it's going to be a three hour road race, unless you're attacking right out of the gate, uh, I, I, I half the time don't even warm up for those. My warm up is literally riding my bike to the, to the start line, especially if there's going to be a rollout, in which case warm up yeah. is almost purposeless. Um, if it's a, a time trial, and, and you're going to, you're going to be going fast right from the start, you know, obviously gradually easing into the pace you're going to hold, but it's still going to be a really high pace right off the, off the ramp. Then, you know, it's, it's going to be more specific, uh, kind of what Hannah described, just taking, taking your time, kind of letting things open up and then easing into some, at some point, some race pace efforts, and then dialing it back a little bit so that you have a reprieve between the warm up and the start, but obviously not too long a one. And then with criteriums and anything, uh, cross country mountain bike race, anything that's going to take off really hard. If you're not braced for that, if you haven't established or, you know, fortified the neuromuscular communication, you're, you're, you're stacking the deck against yourself and, and, and both psychologically and physiologically, or I should, should have said that in the, in the other order, but the psychological component's a big one, because if you've already kind of primed yourself for something that hurts that bad, even if you've just done a toned down version of it and you should, um, small ring sprints work great for, for a really fast start. I mean, if you're going to be one of those guys who wants to chase the first lap preem, or you just want to be up front, or you just want to start hurting people early. Cause you're feeling great, whatever reason, just some small ring sprints, do everything you're going to need. You don't need to do some big gears stomps trying to, you know, <laughs> uh, affect things in the most important way, the most important training way, probably. So, I mean, be realistic about it. Don't overdo it, but it, it, oh, it just comes down to keeping it simple. And, and everyone's touched on this. Who's spoken so far at this, what are you facing? Well, do a little bit of that. I mean, and if it's going to be a lot of those things, do a little bit of each of those things and, and stagger them in whatever ways you want. If you look at the workouts or the warmups that we've, uh, that, that, uh, uh, are staged prior to every workout. I mean, the workouts always specific or the warmups, sorry, is always specific to the workout always has some efforts 99% of the time, some efforts that are just like what you're going to do. And then sometimes it's, it's a more general warm up that is specific to a race simulation. And you'll see all sorts of things that even though they don't specifically apply to the workout, they're purposeful. And, and even some big gear stomp or, uh, you know, some really high intensity, 150%, 10 seconds at a time, proceed a time trial. It's like, well, what's that for? Well, you will rely on those fast twitch fibers. It to, to, to some extent. So why not prime them with some things that aren't going to negatively impact them? Yeah. Don't you feel like, uh, mentally it helps you too, when you know, it's going to be a really hard start to 100%. get a gauge for how you're going to feel on that day to, mm -hmm. to kind of emulate some of those efforts. I don't, I mean, yeah, I know it does for me. Oh yeah. It's huge. And that kind of brings up 
uh, the let's talk about the Team Sky warm up that was you know that's been made famous. Uh, so effectively, what that is is uh, Bradley Wiggins talks about this a lot of the time. He had the he had the same warm up every time, and he used that same warm up because it was like a good diagnostic tool. Uh, it allowed him to basically say, "Okay, cool, I'm." you know, I'm, I'm going to, I feel like this today when I'm riding at the intended race intensity. And as a result, I'll adjust my plan, something else. I'll adjust the pacing strategy. Um, at least I assume that's the logic, uh, behind it. Uh, he says that it was repeatable so then they could get a good fix for where they were at on the day. I've tried to implement that before, but I found that to be pretty damaging to my ability to be able to deliver in races a lot of the time. And here's why. So in this sort of format, you ride at threshold for a short period of time, then you do these sprints and you're really trying to pay attention to how you feel during that, that threshold portion. And it, when there were days and I didn't feel good, I was like, okay, well, I don't feel good. So today's going to be terrible. And it was hard for me to then overcome that later on in the race, because I had a, something that was reliable and concrete. And there were days when I did that same effort and I felt incredible. And today I don't feel that. So therefore it can't be a good day. It's going to be a bad day. And then what it would do is it would uh, affect my execution. And I think many times caused me to race underneath my, my abilities just because I was mentally holding myself back because of that indicator, the diagnostic tool warm up that we have beforehand. Amber always mentions this from the perspective of approaching something with curiosity. And if you have a warm up that's placed in front of your racing to completely remove curiosity and give you a programmatical predefined approach, I do think that it can hurt you. Now, granted, it might also be really good to know, like when you go in and you do a warm up. I mean, if you feel genuinely really, really, really bad, then sure, it can help you understand things later on, but it still shouldn't govern how you race, in my opinion. I think that you should still go out and race and, and give it your all and, and give it a shot. So I think that this is kind of like a good dovetail into the psychological side of things and what you're supposed to be doing during a warm up or what benefit you have from that. Um, Ivy, I'm going to ask you first and, and, you know, there's music and all the other sorts of motivation that you can bring in as well during a warm up. but what are you trying to mentally accomplish? Like what's the mental state or what are the things that you are trying to accomplish with your warm up so that by the end you are in a specific mental spot um nothing else other than to feel like i know exactly what i'm in for um and how i'm physically going to respond what it'll feel like what to expect um mm -hmm. that's it so that that goes for i mean like the whole scope of getting ready for a ride that goes for like timing and make sure, making sure I have plenty of time and uh, reducing stress and um, for race warmups specifically uh, music to get in the right headspace. Um, but yeah, I really just want to, I mean, like the reason why we warm up for getting our legs open and being physically ready is to make it, make sure that we we aren't shocked by the effort that's about to take place, right? And so that's basically what I'm trying to prepare myself for. Yeah. on the mental side too. Yeah. Hannah, how about you? Uh, you mentioned the psychological portion of your warm up is huge. Yeah, I think, um, gosh, there's just so much to this. And I think it's really interesting what you brought up with team sky, because it makes sense to apply to them because they can change the race hypothetically, mm -hmm. depending on how they feel, but it really doesn't make sense for anyone else that I can think of. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it, you know, if you're not yeah. in the world tour road racing and you have a team where you can go to all your teammates and say, Hey, this is my sensation. Let's do this today. I mean, I'm not going to go to on the start line and ask all the ladies if we can ease into the race a little bit more, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So it really honestly does not matter how I feel in the warm up, And for that reason, you know, with athletes that I coach and such, I think it's really important to practice this, um, and create these data points in training as well. I'll actually have people make a note myself included when they feel really, really bad and warm up, but then have a great workout because it happens all the time. And so it's super important to remember those times and have those times data marked in your mind on race day. You can say, Oh yeah, I feel bad today, but 
I did the last time I set a PR in my workout too. So it, you really have to take it with a grain of salt. Um, and I think for a lot of people that means structuring it a certain way, it might mean changing up your warm up, or it might be warming up with different metrics. So I think for some people, even though you use power every single day of your life, you might warm up on race day, you know, with more heart rate or perceived exertion, just so you don't get hung up on those numbers, because at that point they're arbitrary, you're not training, you're not, you know, trying to create structure. You're just simply trying to prepare your body for the race ahead. And so for me, that's really what I'm doing in warm up is I'm trying to free my mind of all expectations. So that's why I always start with the spin, because if I, I've found that if I get on the bike and I just say, okay, I'm going to ride aerobically immediately, it's what does this feel like? How do my legs feel? What do they feel like when I first get on the bike? What power do I gravitate towards? If I get <laughs> on and I just say, I'm going to spin, that's it. That's all then I find that it's just so much easier to be like, oh yeah, the wattage is low because I'm not expecting it to be high because this is what I'm setting for myself. And so I, I kind of carry that throughout the whole warm up. is there's no expectation. It's just like Amber would say, oh, this is, you know, I'm entering with curiosity. This is how I feel today. That's very interesting that this is how I feel. Huh, I wonder how that'll impact X, Y, and Z, but it's not setting up any sort of, it's not, oh, this is how the race is going to be. It's not changing my race strategy. It's not, it's not even really changing the warm up that I'm going to do. It's just going through doing the check marks that I need to do. And then, you know, what I'm really doing mentally during that is finding the things that I can believe. So I'm saying statements to myself that I can buy into and every race they're different. You know, sometimes it is, I'm going to win. And I can believe that. And sometimes that's really hard to believe. So I have to break it down to something different. It's I'm going to crush this one climb every lap. And I can believe, I can believe that. And so I'll focus on that and buy into that. And it's finding those phrases that you really truly believe and can hang on to going to the start line. Mm. This, uh, this resonates with me. I've gone, I've tried a bunch of different warmups, a bunch of different things. I'm an overthinker, so I've overthought a lot of it. And these days, what I typically settle on is <clears throat> I ride for 10 minutes and that's just low intensity. That's just cruising. It's typically like riding to the race or I'll just ride away from the venue and ride to it. If it's cold, I like to be able to have a trainer, which we're going to get into this and Chad's questions, which are great. But otherwise, it's just when I'm typically riding around. Then after 10 minutes, what I do is I just slowly ramp it up until what I feel like is a threshold effort and emphasis on feel like I'm not trying to ride at power. I'll glance down then and I'll look at power. And once again, just like Hannah said, it's like, okay, interesting. So let's see what it feels like if I hold that for another four to five minutes. And then after that, then I relax and I might do some quick spin ups and that's about it. Um, and that's my warm up. And how many times has this happened to all of us where during the warm up, we felt something and in the race, we feel something very different. Like it's, it's it, for me, it's very rare that the warm up is exactly how I will feel also in the race. Uh, Chad just went through a laundry list of different things that are coming on board and getting flipped on and changing in our body when we warm up. And for us to think that it's just like instant, perfect diagnostic that when we do the warm up, it's absolutely everything's on board and where we can check the systems for how it'll feel later. Eh, it's, we're more complex beings than that. Uh, so as a result, during your race, it's probably going to feel a bit different than your warm up. So that's why I try to not put too much stock behind it. I just simply try to get there for a while. And for me, it's almost purely psychological. Honestly, it's just getting to the point where I'm not shocked by the effort because I'm shocked by the effort. Every single time I ride by the first effort, I'm always shocked. It's always hard. So why not get the shock out of the way? So then I can just focus and see when I'm on course. That's really kind of like my whole point behind warmups. I showed up at a short track race last week with like zero warm up because just didn't have time. Got to the race, I think with like five minutes to go. And yeah, starting with a bunch of incredibly fast juniors, it just blew my doors off. But even then in those moments, it's a good thing. We're talking about psychological preparation of these warm ups. I could have easily fallen into the trap and it was tempting to go, well, this race is going to go terribly because I haven't warmed up. 
And it's, you know, I'm going to get blown out right at the beginning of the race. It's going to be really hard. And I could run through all the scenarios in my mind, but instead I was just like, you know what? You're fine. Like you've done plenty of efforts where you've gone really hard in the beginning. And then that's just how it stuck, whether it's a group ride that you didn't anticipate to last that long or anything else. Um, so I had to remove all of those temptations from my mind and just approach it with curiosity. Uh, so I think, because yeah. perfect warmups aren't also guaranteed, like, you know, we don't always have the time to be able to do them like that. Yeah. I think that the physical sensations of warm up are rarely the same as the race, but the mental sensations are almost always the same. Yeah. You know, if you're really struggling mentally in the warm up, I wouldn't expect the switch to flip when you hit the start line. Same way as if you're jazzed and you're excited and you're energized and man, I'm going to crush this race. You're probably not going to get to the start line and be like, Oh, but I didn't warm up. Well, you know, yeah. like it's right. it, you're gonna, you're, it's go, the mental aspect is going to carry over. And so that's really what I would emphasize more than anything. Mm -hmm. Chad, what sort of questions would you have in this case for William about the warm up? Kind of like some contextual questions that you could ask him that maybe help. I have that. several, but I want to, I want to be included on this particular line yeah, of conversation please. right now, because it, it, I'm not saying you need to divorce yourself from the psychological aspects of warming up because they're, they're crucial. They're super important, but I am saying there's a way to mitigate their impact on, on your headspace. And that's by not taking your warm up seriously. I, I I've done enough races and I've done probably more workouts than most people on the planet, most endurance athletes. <laughs> it's been a consistent part of my life for, you know, 30 plus years. And, it, it, and over that time, I've recognized that just like everyone has touched on already is that the warm up does not dictate where I'm at. It, 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 and for that reason, especially during race prep or, or a pre race warm up, I never look at the data. I mean, that's not to say I never look at the data. I might glance down at it, but I never let that sink in. It's just, it doesn't matter. I, I need to, I'm doing a time trial. So I need to feel what a time trial effort is. I don't care what the Watts tell me right now. It's just, okay, this is how hard a time trial feels. Cause those Watts are probably not the Watts I'm going to deliver. Especially if I know I've done the work, I've done the recovery, I've done the nourishment. I'm going to, I'm in a good place mentally. I mean, if everything's there already setting the stage for me, I'm not going to let my warm up talk me out of a good performance. Hmm. So so just kind of at least detach, don't divorce from it, but detach from what the warm up is telling you, you know, just if you look at the data, don't let it affect you. If you don't want to look at the data, don't look at the data, just do the efforts that you know you have to do a sprint to sprint. doesn't matter if you're generating 1500 Watts or 500 Watts. If you got on it real hard, you're accomplishing what you need to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Y'all have a special warm up screen on your head unit. Cause I do. It's just, yeah, I do. Oh sure yes. That, yeah. yeah. It's called, it's called electrical tape. <laughs> <laughs> Cover that crap up. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, man. It's, it's something that once again, we have a tendency to overthink all of us endurance athletes and the warm up is one where we can tie ourselves in a knot rather than enabling ourselves for a good performance. So well said Chad, like, why would you let a, why would you let a warm up uh, derail something that you've built for, in a very measured and responsible way for months. Like uh, you have a track mm -hmm. record that proves that you'll be able to perform, right? So don't let that warm up. And, and even on the days where it's quite the opposite, where you're like, I am going to feel terrible today. I have, I've barely trained or, you know, I took a week off the bike or everything's is, is, is standing against me right now. And my warm up feels great. Doesn't feel great. Doesn't, doesn't matter. It, it's still probably not going to bear a real influence <laughs> on, on how you race. Yeah. Well, and unless you warm up on a trainer, it's going to be different every time anyways. Mm -hmm. So you have no to allow what. for flexibility. Yeah. Chad, what questions would you have uh, for William? Do you have a handful of them here? And I think that they can bring up some good talking points on how to execute a warm up. Yeah. So, so first we, we've, we've touched on these already. My biggest question we haven't, or we have, but we have, we have different views on it and that's going to be fun to discuss. <laughs> so first off, is it cold? I mean, that that's, that's an easy get. I mean, we just talked about muscles function better when they're warmed and, and they function better when they're kept warm. You can't warm up, let them cool off and then expect to have all the, mm -hmm. the benefits of the warming. Um, Chad, can I, can I go nerd on this one really quick? Sure. Uh, because this one matters a lot to me, um, on the temperature side of things, you mentioned warming up for a criterium. I'm sure you're thinking of the Davis 4th of July criterium that you've raced plenty of times when it's just always so extremely hot. hot. And it's a criterium that's usually really fast. And it's also a lot of turns. You can go onto our YouTube channel and you can see Brown examples roads. of 
of that one. So I don't think I've ever done it under hundred degrees. I, I really don't. Yeah. And it's always hard. And the reason that it's always hard is because you've got those turns that are constant in that course, snaking back and forth. So it means that the race is always, if you're not moving forward, you're moving back. It's one of those situations. It's pretty hard to sit in. So in a race like that, you do want to make sure that you're warmed up. But warming up in, in and of itself just raises your core temperature quite a lot. And then if you do it on a trainer, it's going to raise your core temperature even higher because you're lacking that evaporative cooling that you have from moving. Because even on a windy day when it's you know over 100 degrees and really hot, that you don't get much effect when you're just sitting still like that. You get a whole a lot more when you're moving. Races like that are the best case, uh, best promotion or support for cooling vests. I mean, yes. you, you, it doesn't matter if you sit in the shade with fans on you, fans are blowing warm air. Shade only does so much that the cooling vest actually makes a tremendous impact in events like that. I agree. And, th- and this is why like for an event like cyclocross, when it's cold, I think that the trainer is awesome for warming up rollers, something like that, because it's so cold that if you ride around outside, <laughs> you might be just freezing yourself, you know, but just by moving through the air at a high rate of speed, when you're trying to warm up. Whereas if you can warm up on those rollers, it's great. Also, th- like when you think about this, remember Chad said that you're trying to bring a whole lot of systems online. And if you do raise your core temperature too much, it's not like you can just like quickly cool off, you know, within that 10 minutes and you're ready to go for the start line. Mm-hmm. Core temperature actually takes quite a while to adjust. Mm-hmm. There's, and it's not something that just uh, the effects are instant as soon as we can, and we can't just like drop it by stepping into the shade. And it's, it's so, dependent on the ambient conditions too. So if you're sitting in a hundred degree or 90 degree ambient conditions, you can only expect to cool so much. Yeah. So think about that in terms of what is the temperature going to be? And then for me, that's my next decision from that is, okay, am I going to warm up stationary or am I going to warm up on the road moving through or on the trail, whatever else it might be. Um, that's a, a big point that I think doesn't get enough, uh, focus. So yeah, it's, I think it's a really good question. Sorry, Chad. Yeah, well, no, it's fine. And still on the topic of, of cold temperature, because I'm, ass- I'm not assuming anything, but if it is a cold, a cold ride, then, you know, the warm up is going to, uh, carry different impact or you're going to have to focus on different things. than if it's a hot ride, but let's assume it's cold. We've already determined that, or already, you know, laid out that muscles just function better when they're warm. But this is something, honestly, it may be come across, but I didn't really process it. But this, the speed of muscle relaxation is also affected by the temperature. And it's a pretty surprisingly high temperature where they're still affected. It was, mm. I can't remember what it is in, in Celsius, but it was like high 70s in Fahrenheit, wow. which is not particularly cold, but it does have an impact apparently on how quickly, how well they relax. Mm. And we talked a number of times about, you know, muscles resisting muscles, you know, get, you got, uh, synergists and, and agonists and I'm sorry, and a- agonists and antagonists. So, you know, if, if we're pushing down the pedals and our quadriceps are firing and our glutes are firing to some extent and our hamstrings are for whatever reason, resisting because it's cold temperatures or cool temperatures, and they can't quite let go as readily as they would, you know, we're working against ourselves, which even if it's two milliseconds, two milliseconds magnified times 90 repetitions per minute times however many minutes that lasts, it it can, it can be an impact. So we do take an efficiency hit when the muscles aren't sufficiently warm, even on the other side of things, the relaxation side of things, not even the contraction side of things. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the temperature is absolutely a concern on on both sides of it. And then my, my second question is what's your typical cadence. And I know Hannah mentioned this already and there's the, the cadence you're going to ride at and whether or not that serves you best is, is debatable. That's a whole other conversation, but the warm up cadence shouldn't be direct mimicry of, of, of what your usual cadence is, or even what your race cadence is going to be, because we've talked about how some of that quick spinning does do things that, that may not seem directly applicable, but will carry performance benefits. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, what intensities are, are you actually encountering during that first hour? This is a big deal because, you know, are you, then you have to ask yourself, just like we're talking about with the specificity of the warmups, are you priming the right energy systems? Are you priming the right muscle fibers? Did you do small efforts at the intended intensities? Because the, and, and it's the same thing, that warm up simplification, you need to replicate what's ahead. Don't surprise your body. Don't surprise your brain. Do the things that are similar to what you're expecting to do soon. So if you're 
you know, rolling into this and maybe you've got 10 minutes to get to the start of the ride and you just noodle over there and then, you know, it's going to be a fast start. Well, surprise, surprise, you're not ready for that. And this is going to be harder on you than it is for the people who may be on their roll over, did a couple hard efforts. And then this brings me to our biggest question. I think this is the one we can, we can jive on the most is <laughs> why do your friends always fall apart toward the end? And, and, and I know each of us, I've seen it on paper and I've heard, heard, heard it mentioned, have, have different theories on this. But frankly, I, I see it as they're just not pacing as well as you are. I think you might be getting it right. You're rolling into a long ride, holding a little bit back at the beginning or resisting it or you know suffering, but then you end up feeling better toward the end of it tells me they're all going out too hard. They're all expending too much too soon, such that the last hour of the ride is miserable for them. And they're looking at you like, why are you still so fresh? Well, I didn't blow myself up in, in the first hour or two. <laughs> yeah. And when you're psychologically in a state where like, oh, I need a long time to warm up. I need to do that. You're going to ride efficiently. You're going to ride conservatively. You're going to do all those necessary things to be able to conserve energy and pace properly, right? So I, I think that this is where the, the big point lies. It's the story you tell yourself about you and your needs to warm up and how that affects your pacing. And then you're inherently considering your situation against your friends. And you're considering that your friends have the ideal state and you do not, which is something we all do with every race. We show up to a race and we just think about whether we're in perfect condition or not. And we never think about the fact that everybody else is asking the same exact question and thinking that, oh, I'm not perfect today. So it, that's almost, that, that should be erased. Uh, nobody warms up perfectly in relation to you. Uh, don't think of it in that regard. Everybody always feels uncomfortable in the beginning. That is part of it. In most cases, most people that are amateur cyclists, not professionals, and I don't know, maybe Hannah and Ivy can back us up here and say it's the case in professionals too, but most cyclists also go out too hard. Uh, so if you combine all of these factors, maybe in this case, William, you're just, you're just, a, you're, you're doing great. Like it's normal. You just make sure that if you do need to do something like a warm up and you have time to do a warm up, sure, you can do it. If you don't have time to do a warm up, go in and expect the first little bit to feel uncomfortable, but continue to pace yourself and you'll, you'll be in a good spot, but never think that you are the only one with a problem or the only one that's unique in this case. Everyone feels something that's likely very similar to what you're feeling on the bike. Hannah, I don't know. Do you have anything else to add on this one? Yeah, I think that, um, this is where you have to decide what you want to accomplish and then you have to get over it mentally. So if you want to have your best race or your best ride, then maybe you're pacing it perfectly and you should take joy in the fact that you're beating everyone at the end, because just like you're saying, how are they beating me at the start? You even said they're asking you how much, how do you have this much energy at the end? So I think in some ways it can be a grass is always greener situation. And if this is what works for you and, and that's how you feel, then instead flip the script mentally and be proud of your resilience and your endurance. Um, but on the other hand, if you would prefer, or you even want to just try to be a different kind of racer, have a different kind of ride, try to change your expectation and to go out really, really, really hard at the start and see what happens. Uh, just like Jonathan said, you know, a lot of races, we all start too hard and we all know that we start too hard. It's a part of racing. It's almost a game of chicken. You know, and that's usually <laughs> yeah. I'm on the throttle, the first lap, just saying it's going to slow down. Everybody hurts. It's going to slow down. Everybody hurts because that's <laughs> the truth. No one is holding that pace. So the next hour and a half, three hours, eight hours, whatever, you know, if it's Leadville, whatever it is, everyone's starting just a little bit too fast. And some people, a lot of it too fast. So <laughs> look at, yeah, look just at, don't look be at afraid what, of that. <laughs> look at what William's describing though. He's not saying the race or the, the ride starts too hard and I get dropped. He's saying it starts too hard and I hang in there. I mean, exactly what you're yeah. describing right now. And then what happens toward the end of this ride, 
is, is he's the one who's excelling, you know, in a race, you know, that translates to success. I mean, you're, yeah, you're, you're true. on the podium, you're in the top 10, you're the winner. I mean, yeah. because you, you did it right. So he's getting through the hard part, which leads me to believe that none of this is really physiologically explicable. I think, mm -hmm. I think this is all on, on the psychological side. He's deciding to interpret feelings in a particular way that's setting his headspace up to not fail, but to struggle. When mm -hmm. if he just would let himself off that leash and recognize, oh, this is the way it goes, and then I'm good in the last hour, so I'm just going to trust that I'm obviously not getting it wrong. This is hard, but racing is group rides are workouts are just just get okay with it because my belief is that William, you're mentally reigning in your physical capabilities. They're there, they they can do the job. You're just fighting them early on, and and then benefiting from the fact that they're still existent in the, in that last hour where you're surpassing everybody else. So there's a couple of things too, that I think, I think one, just flip the script and say, everybody's hurting. And like Chad just said, I'm hanging in and then I'm winning. So woohoo. I'm victorious. And some people are great at masking yeah, that, right? Yeah. Anna? And some people exactly. are really good at looking like they're totally fine when they're not. And everyone is better than you if that makes sense, because you know what you're feeling. And so even if you're masking it well, at least for me, I, I never really know if I am or not, uh, you know, cause in my head, I know what I'm feeling, but I don't know what anyone else is feeling. Um, but the other thing I would do is one, if you have a power meter, see what the difference is, see if you are going harder at the start. Um, and then the other side of that too, is just one time carve out some extra warm up before the start and see if that actually does make a difference or if it is just indeed a hard beginning of the ride and then that kind of starts to eliminate some of these variables and it'll help you tell a more accurate story in your head yeah advice. yeah fantastic advice uh separating this from williams experience if you show up to the race and you want to get in a warm up, but you don't have the time and you're stressed and you're everything else, it's uh, once again, so much of warm ups is the psychological preparation. And if you show up in just a state and you are twisted in knots, it's going to be difficult to get a whole lot of value out of that. Um, Ivy, you have a few tips that you would give people just to, to kind of arrive at the race a little bit more calm and less disorganized and scrambled. Uh, what, what tips would you give to? to set yourself up for success with your warm up. Yeah. When you were saying that, I just had flashbacks of being less organized and <laughs> yeah. showing up to register when people are like on their trainers and I'm like, whoops, nope. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> didn't, uh, yeah. Spoiler alert. The race didn't go very well. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, specifically if we're talking about um, a crit and riding to a race or a short track or something that you can ride to, um, I like to ride there because I feel like that process of, um, looking at the venue map, figuring out how I'm going to ride there, knowing how long it'll take me, knowing how much time it'll take me and packing my little bag with, um, all the clothes that I may or may not need and like recovery drink and snacks and everything, um, just makes me feel like I'm having a plan that takes away, I feel like when I'm driving a car to a race, I kind of lean on it as a crutch a little bit. And I'm going to just throw all your junk in your car and, um, you don't really need to look, or I feel like I don't need to look that closely at exactly how long it'll take me, how, like where I will park, um, how far away I have to park from registration, how it, it leaves a lot of variables unknown for how long it will take me to actually get ready for the race. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's why I like to when I can ride to a race. I think there's, uh, I've mentioned this before, but I just build out in the notes app or my phone or whatever else you have, like easily accessible. I typically build out like a, an outline based on the schedule of the race. And it's like, I start at the start of the race and then I think, okay, I'll probably want to be show up to the line five to 10 minutes ahead of time, like five minutes ahead, depending on the race. Sometimes you have to show up really early for call up. Sometimes you don't. And then from there I'll think, okay. And then it'll take me, I want to have this amount of time for my warm up, And then I want to have this amount of time to get dressed, this amount of time to pin my number on that sort of stuff. And then that means I want to arrive at the race at this point, which means I want to leave my house by this point. 
And it, but I, I set that all up in my phone. So I don't have to think about that schedule and recreate that schedule in my mind all the time and wonder it's a small thing, but it makes everything else fall into place. And then it makes it so that when my warm up is there, I don't stress about time. I don't stress about anything else. I just know that my only focus right now is, is just getting my body ready and get my mind well, ready. On that topic, let's let's talk about what happens in the event that you get there close to it and the warm up doesn't happen because I think we've all been in that situation and there there's really a couple of routes to go. You either just grit your teeth and know this is going to be really hard. I'm, I'm not physiologically ready. I'm not mentally braced. I'm probably still distracted because I showed up late and and I barely got everything together just in time to get here and now the race is starting. Or you can check out and and. and Maybe the extreme side of things, you're like, I'm not even going to race. I showed up. I didn't get my warm up in. This is what, why bother? Bother because you can work <laughs> your way through some misery and, and still hang in there. Maybe it won't be your best race. Maybe you'll miss an early break. Maybe, I don't know. So, so many things can happen, but you'd be surprised over the course of even a short 30 minute crit, how much your system, your body and your brain can, can rally and get you back in it. Just because you miss your warm up, or just because your warm up isn't exactly what you wanted it to be, maybe it was a bit truncated. Again, don't take your warm up too seriously. And if you miss your warm up, don't don't write off that race. You'd be surprised at what you can deal with if you'll just make yourself do it. I always think of it as there's going to be an effort early on in my day that is going to be extremely uncomfortable, <laughs> and that's inevitable. It's going to hit, like no matter what. And if I have time to warm up, fantastic, because then I can get that one out of the way and then show up into the race and be familiar with what that feels like. And then that's, it's not going to hurt as much just because I'm familiar with it. That's it. Like it's, that's all it is. Like my body or my mind tells me that, Hey, I've just recently done this and I made it through. Therefore I can do it again. And I've shown up to our local crits with like zero chance to warm up because of time. And on the line, I've taken a bunch of different approaches in this situation, but on the line, I've simply gone, well, it's going to hurt. So I might as well actually, and this is my brain. So this, this may not lead to success, but like, it's going to hurt really bad. So I might as well actually just go extremely hard from the gun because it's going to hurt everybody else. And then I get it out of the way. And then I have the rest of the race where it's not going to feel as hard. Uh, I, that's the story I tell myself. And then as a result, that's what happens. Like, it, it's all comes down to what we end up telling ourselves and, and how we move through it that way. So, yeah, I mean, uh, your warm up isn't always going to be perfect and you have to be versatile enough and you have to understand that be smart enough to know what you're getting at here. And that's to just get yourself mentally prepared. The physical stuff is going to come online as well, but you can think your way in out of a good race and you can think your way into a good race. And it's really just up to, to how you want to view it. So yeah. I would also say if you get there late and instead of a 25, 30 minute warm up, you only have 10 minutes, I wouldn't just do the first 10 minutes of your warm up mm. routine and then call it a day. I would condense everything into that 10 minutes. So shorter spin, shorter aerobic, shorter tempo, one spin up and one race effort, and then be done. Like just push it all together, get it all done or as much as you can done and get to the start line. Don't just spin around for 10 minutes it's not going to do a lot for you. I would agree with that. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Really good advice. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's go into, and it's something kind of new. Uh, if, if I can, we're, we're calling it live questions and rapid fire slash Chad's corner. Maybe we should trademark Chad's corner. I like that <laughs> oh. <In> picture. <laughs> Chad doesn't like it. I'm picturing having a chillo in the corner and a comfy chair. It's fantastic. Definitely so. not that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Chad, you had some things that you wanted to bring up based on things that we've covered on previous podcasts and just things that you've, uh, you've looked through, uh, recently. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, what do you want to start with? Well, one, one thing was something that, uh, importantly, or it's a bummer got overlooked. It was a kind of my culminating argument or not argument, but support for stretching because we, we talked about all these acute effects, all the things that happen when you stretch and immediately after and you work out immediately after your workout, what, what you can expect. And we didn't, uh, I didn't get to, I got distracted from the benefits of doing this chronically. So, so anything that we do one, once or twice has effects, but the chronic effects are typically extensions of that, or they're the improved version of what you're seeking, right? That the sustained version of it. So with the, with those two things in mind, I, 
I almost look at it as they're stretching and then there's structured stretching. So anything you add structure to makes it probably a chronic affair, something that's repeated, something that's going to have an effect and that effect's going to carry because you're repeating it and you're touching it up and you're staying on top of it. And, and there were a couple studies uh, that just had uh, basic takeaways. One looked at quad stretching, which is super important to us. And it was just over the course of six weeks and it was just three times a week. So and the, the stretches themselves, and this is just quads. I, I understand when you stretch other body parts, you're, you're doing this for all the body parts and, and the time committed to your mobility work grows and grows and grows. But honestly, a cyclist, if we just stretch quads, probably going to tie into our hip flexors and our low backs and, and do other favorable things anyway. So let's just pretend all we're stretching is quads. These guys did it, like I said, for six weeks, three days a week. And all they did were six 30 second static stretches. So set it into a quad stretch, held it for 30 seconds, repeated that five more times. And, and, and the takeaways are that their, their knee flexion range of motion. So the range of motion that they're trying to improve and the rate of force development in, in the stretched legs significantly improved, significantly improved in the stretch group. So, so the point is, is, even though the goal was flexibility, they actually got an improvement in the rate of force development. And this is something, and it's not even the, the RFD improvement that impresses me so much as changes happen due to the consistency. So, you know, you can't get range of motion improvements and hope to keep range of motion improvements if you only stretch here and there. So consistency is, is important. A couple of takeaways from this study in particular <clears throat> is just three times a week led to a, tr a translatable endurance performance improvements. Second takeaway is that unexpected improvements actually yielded performance improvements. And, and it makes sense. If we have greater greater range of motion, that's one thing, but that rate of force development, you know, when you activate the muscles, they respond more quickly. That's super beneficial. And, and, and it, and it makes sense that it would come as a result of increased mobility because you don't have muscles that are resisting themselves. It's easier to recruit them because, you know, they, they have greater mobi mobility, greater flexibility. So one benefit of, of chronic stretching in a similar manner. And another study looked at, uh, targeting, uh, stretching, they did basically the same thing three times a week, um, three to six sets of 15 to 30 second stretches, which sounds like, Oh God, I got to write all this down. This is super important. I got to get this exactly right. But I think the takeaway from this <clears throat> is they, they reduced it. They kind of removed all of this reliance on math and just said, accumulate 120 seconds per muscle group per session. So whatever this troubled area is, let's use the quads again, or maybe the hip flexors two minutes, just do two minutes per session. And it was really flexible in its nature. You could do 15 <laughs> second stretches, 30 second stretches. You could do one, two minute stretch. It was just accumulate that amount of time. And this will, in fact, it did in fact, in this study lead to improvements in range of motion. They pointed out a couple subtle points that I didn't get to cover last time. So I'm going to cover now is that uh, the greater your range of motion deficiencies are, the, the less stretching. As counterintuitive as that may sound, the less stretching. You're starting from a lower point, so you can ease into it more gradually, get the smaller gains before you get, start, start ch chasing the bigger ones. But once you have adapted and you have those bigger gains, if you want to continue to improve it, it's going to require greater volume. You're not going to be able to just do those two minutes and expect to increase your range of motion further. But in a lot of cases, you probably don't need to. But 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 the that point is- Right. Yeah. Just like training. Right. Yeah. Just well, like well, why that, gymnasts that's exactly hold, my point. Yeah. Well, gymnasts hold the splits for five plus minutes and they would have to be on the far end. Of that. Exactly. So, yeah. 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 They're sense. not going to do it for two minutes and expect yeah. to do the things that they can do. Um, and then finally, if you do it chronically, you can actually get away with greater intensities, which brings me to the final point that I didn't get to cover was the intent, the, the impact of intensity or really the flexibility. I use that term again, the, <laughs> yeah, the flexibility of intensity. You can stretch, I encourage stretching to lower intensities and the research encourages stretching to lower intensities when it's pre-workout. They, the, the, a study in particular looked at stretching to 85% discomfort. So that's a pretty uncomfortable stretch versus 50% discomfort, which is you know, pretty tolerable comparatively. And, and noted that the 85% actually diminished hamstring strength. In this case, that's what they were stretching. Whereas the 50% did not. So pre-workout, don't get too crazy with your stretches. If you're going to do static stretching at all post-workout, however, you can get away with, with quite a lot. The intensity yeah. can be whatever you want. Cause the impact isn't going to be as, as a, uh, it's not going to be as big a deal overall takeaway. Just what we said, uh, just with, as it is with structured endurance training, consistency, 
it, it, it's that fundamental, the key to that fundamental, meaningful, lasting benefit. You can't just do it here and there and hope for the best. You got to get on it, stay on it. Consistency is so not exciting, right? It's, like it's, it's just not, not sexy, but it's, you mean but it you works. can't just power stretch once a week? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Power stretch. <laughs> I stretch so hard, but that I only very, do it for a minute every four weeks. <laughs> I can't walk now, but it really helps. So. Yeah. Splits were accomplished. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, let's go through just a few questions, uh, semi rapid fire. You can answer them with one word. You can answer them with a word and explanation why as well, uh, about pre-race routines. This also addresses quite a few questions that we've got from different people. So do you do, and what we'll do is we'll go through the order of Ivy, Hannah, and Chad, just counterclockwise on this, on, on the screen for me at least. So, okay, let's go through. What do you do the day before the race in terms of openers or no openers? Ivy. Uh, openers. Openers. I can say one word, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hope. Oh, yeah. One word okay. or a quick explanation. Yeah, yeah. Openers or if it's an XCO, that's usually in the form of a hot lap. Good point. Chad, day before. Uh, I'm kind of removed from this. It, it, it was, it was <laughs> wide true. ranging. It all depended on... It, what was going on that day. So sometimes openers, sometimes, uh, just an easy ride and sometimes nothing. So no real consistency there <laughs> on the heels of talking about the importance of consistency. I, I do things <laughs> he says, yeah. Uh, Ivy, uh, any tips to make sure you don't forget anything before a race? You kind of shared one already, but yes, I used to have a checklist. Um, but that didn't work. Um, because I raced too many disciplines now and everything I need and with all mm. the weather and, um, you know, everything's different. Uh, so that didn't work for me. Um, so from an equipment standpoint, um, I do this thing where I go from my feet all the way up to my head and like run through the checklist, mm. shoes, socks, leg warmers, bibs, chamois cream, base layer, da, 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 and just go all the way to the top, make sure I have everything. And then I, uh, pack my bag super early. Good tips. Hannah. Yeah. I always pack the day before, even if I'm racing at 3 PM the next day, I'll still pack the bag the day before the race. And then I really like Ivy's feet to head. I usually go, um, from the time I arrive at the race, everything I'll use. I just play through the day in my mind till after the race. Yeah. Chad. Yeah. Same, same idea. I have a race checklist and a travel checklist. So everything I need for the race and I do the, the, the mental inventory that Ivy described exactly from, from feet to head, making sure everything's on my body. And I know I'm at least pretty well off. And then uh, travel checklist is a little different and it's a little different dep dependent upon whether it's car travel or air travel. And then absolutely pack the night before. And just like Hannah said, it doesn't matter if the, if the race is late in the day, it absolves you of that responsibility, helps you clear your mind, helps you focus on more important things. Good tips. That feet to head thing is such a dad move too, by the way, Ivy. That's really? a strong dad. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's akin to like, get up early. We got a big day sort of a thing. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> My dad used to always run through the checklist whenever we'd like, before we go, he'd be like, got your boots, got your socks, you know, and skiing. Over, you know? So, uh, okay. How do you recon the course? Ivy, you first. Depends on the race. Uh, uh, if it's a crit show up early enough to get on the course, at least the race before mine. Um, so if I race at three, and there's a race that starts at two, I plan on getting to the course in time to be kitted up and ready to, to take a lap at 1.55 before that mm -hmm. two o'clock race starts lining up. Um, if it's a road race though, I don't know, no recon, SOL, yeah. look at Strava, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Hope for the best. <laughs> Hannah, how about you? Anything differently you do to recon a race? Uh, for XCO, I usually have kind of a three lap system. So the first lap, I just get through it. Even if I have to walk the sections, I don't put any stress on what I need to do. The second lap is stop and accomplish every feature that I want to accomplish, even if it takes multiple attempts. And then the third lap is hopefully do it all smoothly, link it together with all of the features. Um, and then whatever extra time I have after that, it'll just depend on the course. Uh, and then if it's something longer, like 
gravel or Leadville or something like that. It's usually just recon via maps, which usually focuses on the biggest climbs and elevation changes. Awesome. Chad, yeah. anything we, different we, you do? Not, not anything different, really. The, the one situ if we look at it, this, look at this just from the perspective of road racing being on, on the pavement, um, if it's a short course, we'll actually ride it in criteriums. I mean, you just get on course and ride it 10 times and it's no big deal. It, a road racing course, if it's a long course, we try to drive key sections or we would in the past try to drive key sections. And then if, if it's uh, not terribly long, you can actually drive the whole course. Although I don't think there's a lot to be gained from that because a lot of the time you're not really picking up on, on what you're seeing. So really you're kind of wasting your time. It might make sense to actually, you might have to drive the whole course is what I'm saying. But if you can just start at the finish line, check out, you know, roll this way to check out the start of the race, roll this way to check out the end of the race. Well, uh, you're, you're heading into it with probably more information than a lot of the people are going to come to the line with. I have a whole system. I'll look at the course maps. I'll look at YouTube. I'll look at forums. Uh, those three things to look at like athletes experiences I never put too much stock in a single athletes experience because it's all varied instead of trying to get a broad picture. And then from there, what I'll do is I'll go in and actually have a plan of how the course will, how the race will unfold. And then I typically always try to get boots on the ground to be able to figure it out just in the same way y'all said. So, and, and to provide context, I am speaking from the perspective of when I raced, which a lot of this information wasn't readily available. So you did kind of yeah. have to boots on the ground, go, go check it out physically. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, Google street view is awesome for criteriums because many times you actually have street view there and it can be really helpful. Uh, you can just get a better feel for like, Oh, tall buildings there and prevailing wind always comes from the West. So that means that in this section, we're going to be sheltered and we're going to be able to have coverage and here it ends. So that that's going to be a decisive point on the course, every single lap. Ivy's nodding. She knows what's up with the crit mm -hmm. crit tactics. Um, okay. How long before your race do you like to arrive? Depends if I'm riding and already kitted up and have everything squared away and I'm pre-registered. I, I hate to be too early because then I'm just kind of like sitting around doing more of a warm up than I really need to just kind of wasting time and energy. So if I'm pre-registered and already have my race number and kitted up only like 45 minutes. Um, yeah. If it's like a course I know too. Um, yeah. If I'm driving and need to register and get my number and do all that stuff, like two hours, I like lots of time. I don't like to rush. Awesome. Hannah, how long? 90 minutes. Almost always. Yeah. Chad. Ivy nailed it. I, I, it depends on the circumstances, but it's, it's between 30 minutes and two hours and it all depends on the importance of the event, the accessibility of it. I mean, if I can ride to it and kind of warm on the, on the, like I'm thinking of our local criterium right over there's my mm -hmm. general or passive, if you will, warm up, do a couple laps of the course, jump in with the you know, preceding race for a little bit, line up and go. Yep. Yeah. I'm two hours is my preferred time for anything consequential outside of that. It just enough time to be able to get my warm up and routine in, which typically tends to be 45 minutes. So, um, okay. Next one. Uh, what do you eat before the race and when? Now I'm a pancake gal, uh, nice. <clears throat> through three hours before the race. And then Good. I have, um, like as much, like a ton, like as much as I can. And then, um, I definitely snack, uh, leading up to that, usually bananas, um, bars, and then, um, gels right before the race. Awesome. Hannah. Three hours before the race, I have chocolate chip pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, Specific. John makes the best Touché. chalky chip pancakes in the world. Yeah, oh, I don't eat that, pancakes Keegan? unless there's That's chocolate chips up. in it. <laughs> That's what's up, Keegan. Pancake King. <laughs> Step aside. Yeah, I'm on the podium now. Yeah, it's I actually I, it's don't good. eat anything unless there's chocolate chips in it. <laughs> That's a fair. Yeah. That's a fair Literally, rule. Chocolate chip yeah. pancakes. I put chocolate chips in yogurt. I put chocolate chips in. Mm, pretty much everything. Sometimes I'll just mm. spread them on toast. Really mm -hmm. unpopular one is I put chocolate chips in cottage cheese. What's Ooh. the, um, the Europe, <laughs> the European like chocolate sprinkle thing that they put on toast. What is that called again? Oh, I Nutella? don't know. You know what I'm talking That's about? Not no, sprinkle. It's not sprinkles. That one's like a spread. Yeah. yeah. yeah, it's yeah like I a, don't know. 
sprinkle. I don't know. I travel to Europe with chocolate chips though, because they (laughs) don't have them. And it's so, oh my gosh, it's a lot. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I I put dark chocolate chunks. Like I break up a bar and I put that into the pancakes. And my favorite one is a dark chocolate bar. Oh no. It is better. That's right. No, it's not the same. It's better. (laughs) And and there's this one and it's got um, lavender in it. And I think that's what I made for Ivy when she was there. So lavender, dark chocolate chunks put into a pancake is, inc- it's an experience. It's incredible. Yeah. That was yeah. for the Soldiers Hollow UCI race. And I think oh, the nice. last morning it was, we had a short track one, but yeah, the, the um, XCO was- day, I like woke up and he didn't have pancakes ready. And I was like, John, are you serious? And he's like, oh, sorry. And it made me a pancake really fast. <laughs> Was it the ritual chocolate? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep, I know exactly is. what one the you're talking about, the lavender yeah. one. Oh, yeah. That's good. It's yeah. so good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's fantastic. Sorry, chocolate pancake cool. talk. Yeah, bad. give it a try, Chad. I'm sure you have one of those bars uh, laying around. They're it's delicious. Yeah, I may yeah. have. I mean, we've got a small pile of them, but yeah, no, no. Pancakes are my go-to as well. And I, I don't, as anyone who's listened to the podcast knows, I don't take my nutrition too seriously. It usually works out really well for me too. But I, mean, I can tell you all the science. I can tell you exactly what you should do. But what I do do, do as I doesn't, say, not doesn't as I typically do. align. Yeah, no, I mean, why would I want to make things easier for myself? But it, it, it does depend on the duration for me. I mean, I can play it fast and loose if the event is three hours or less. Once it starts tipping upwards of three hours, I, I got to take things a bit seriously and pancakes are the go-to. Um, I don't, I don't chocolate chip them. I just slather them in syrup, with just a little bit of butter spray. So I'm not heavy on the fat. Mm-hmm. And you know, if I get them in an hour prior or three hours prior, ideally that's great, but I don't, I don't ever think that. Yeah. Yeah. Pancake man, as we've already covered in three hours to three to four hours for me as ideal actually is what I've found. Um, and then I, I snack all leading up to it though. So after two to three hours after those pancakes, I'm just taking in small stuff. Um, so yep. Okay. Uh, we're good. We already covered warm ups, so we don't need to go into that one. Uh, song of choice, favorite song when you're, uh, before you warm up. That changes like weekly. No. Same. Yeah, you don't have a single one. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. Hannah, Not do you have a single path. one that you like? <laughs> <laughs> Someone's attack that's listening to this. <laughs> yeah, Hannah, do you have a song that you like to listen to regularly? I usually don't listen to music at all. Whoa. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> just like focused in the zone. I just like to be aware of my thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. At first, I thought you were nice. going to say like, Hannah, I listen to just be to- able to listen <laughs> to your thoughts before race and be okay. Like, I have no idea. How zen is that? <laughs> I try to remove my thoughts. They're terrible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Head empty. No thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Chad, how about you? No, just like Ivy, it changes by the moment. Um, if I don't have anything in particular, or if I, my creativity is lacking, whatever rage against machine is always a bankable bet. And it's, it yeah. ties way back to days when I actually race aggressively. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually know what Chad means when he says it varies. Cause what he's really saying is that he used to listen to Foo Fighters before every single race. And now that the Dave Grohl book is out, he listens to the audio book. <laughs> that's how I get angry. No, no. If, if anger is my mechanism, that's, that's how I go about it. If any of you want to make uh, Chad not happy, play Foo Fighters around him. Just there we say go. Dave Grohl to me. Oh. Yeah, actually just say the name Dave Grohl. Yeah, it'll light Chad right up. So, uh, okay, where do you like to line up? When we're talking about left side or right side, do you have a preference or front to back of the field? Do you have a preference? Depends on the course, never center, but sometimes if you have a call up, you don't really have a choice. Yeah. Center sucks. <laughs> I, yeah. Horrible. Yeah. Center sucks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hannah, how about you? Yeah. It all just depends on the course, what the whole shot, like what the whole shot is like, what the first corner is like, whether I think I want to be first into the first corner or follow a wheel. Mm-hmm. Chad. It'll definitely depend on the objectives. You know, what I'm there to achieve that day. Am I going for a podium? Am I supporting someone else? Am I just hanging in for a training race? And then uh, very much depends on the confidence in my training and my conditioning. So if I know I'm there to to, to break legs, then I, I don't mind landing <laughs> up dead center and knowing that I'm going to ride away from people in the start. 
and stay in front of them or just be responsive to everything because I can versus going into it with not a lot of faith in my conditioning, in which case I don't necessarily hide, but I don't really care where I end up. Yeah. I wish we had Pete on right now because Pete rolls up to the very back of the field for every single race, for every crit. Yeah. He like stands like intentionally, probably about like 10 feet behind everybody. He and wants to run into one. us, <laughs> yes. benefit from the momentum. <laughs> yeah, it's what he does every single race. It's amazing. It's a power move. Uh, I always try to be at the front. Um, I'll even like, uh, like it's amazing what you can get away with if you just smile and like say hi to people. And there have been times where I have not been toward the front of the race and I'll think, well, why would I go to the back of the field and try to work my way through and said, I can just hop over the barrier and walk toward the starting line from the front and then just turn you're, around and then I'm in the front of everybody. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I Be smile. Clear, you can only do this if you're a famous podcaster, you do this or you'll be that person. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but I'm almost always going to favor the inside as well. Um, so when I say it's inside, uh, if the turn is going to be a left-hander, I want to line up on the left uh, because it gives me control. So um, that allows me to be able to move outward to dodge something. Whereas if I'm outside and somebody gets pushed wide, I have nowhere to go. Um, so the only thing is when you do line up on the inside like that, then you have to make sure that you're one of the early people into that turn, if not the first person, because otherwise an accordion effect is going to slow you down, but I'm almost always going to go for control rather than being in a spot where something is out of my control and it can really throw off my race. But I feel like you're going to be in those positions regardless over the course of that race anyway. So why do you care? For, I think people place too much yeah. importance on their start position in a race. Some races, it definitely matters for sure. You need a whole shot. You need the, the cleanest, quickest line to the single track. But yep. as, as I all often do, I come back to criteriums and this is why I don't care where I line up yep. unless I'm feeling particularly confident because at any point in the race, I'm going to be in all those positions and I'm going to find my way back from them or I won't. Yeah, I should clarify that inside position is for cross country and short track. Uh, if I'm in a crit, I line up on the shaded, on the lee side of the wind of wherever, like I think, okay, first turn or first like significant time, I don't want to be stuck in a position where I'm going to be up against the wind and have the wind battering me. That's what decides my left or right position on a crit. Because like you said, Chad, it doesn't like sprint to the first turn. Great job, won the first turn, who cares, right? But I just look at it in terms of, okay, well, the wind is going to be hitting me from this side. So I'll just pick that side to try to get a bit more shelter. So, uh, okay. <clears throat> Almost through with this one. Last one. What else do you get, or what else do you do to get yourself in the zone? Anything unique? We've talked about the warm ups. Mm -hmm. We've talked about the fact that Hannah doesn't listen to music, which is incredible. I don't know how she does it. And that Chad loves the Foo Fighters, but what do the rest <laughs> of us, <laughs> what do the rest of us do anything in particular to get in the zone? I don't talk. That's what I do. I don't talk. And yeah. if you try to talk to me on the line, I probably will ignore you. And it doesn't affect me if you're trying to talk to me. Cause I don't, I'm in, the, I'm in my world. Like, so I have this focus thing that I can do where I just drop into it and it really helps me feel like I'm ready for it. So that's my, that's my thing. <laughs> Chad's, Chad's got something sassy to say. I can see it. <laughs> I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Hannah. <clears throat> Or uh, Ivy, forgive me, oh, Ivy, Ivy, then Hannah, then Chad. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, I don't feel, uh, I try to make sure that I have alone time. I don't think that's super unique though. Um, and I feel like having homies at races, a lot of people want to do the warm up with you or um, pre-ride pre -ride is okay with homies, but I definitely slot out some time to be able to ride or warm up or do something alone and have quiet time. Hannah. You're up, Hannah. Yeah, I usually, um, <laughs> I usually pray or pray with other people. That's nice. Yeah. Yep. I say a prayer on the starting line every time. Mm -hmm. It's like been a habit of mine since I was a kid and yeah, it helps me. It makes it feel like you're not alone. You know, sometimes I yeah. feel like when all the spectators walk away and you're just standing on the start line, you're like, <gasps> and now it's just me. So that's the time I really like to say a prayer. Yeah. Awesome. Chad. I do anything I can to, to relax, to not take it too seriously, to remind myself that I've done this so many times. There's no reason I should be exceptionally wound up for this particular time. 
Um, I'm good at this. I enjoy this. This can be fun if I'll let it be that, that sort of thing. And, and typically that, uh, comes about in, in the form of chatting to whomever's next to me, especially if it's Jonathan. <laughs> I, was gonna say, if it's Jonathan. <laughs> I don't know if Chad's ever actually talked to me on a starting line. He and I are both very similar in the sense that we t- we are in our own worlds and, and we're happy with that. Uh, the one other thing that I would add is something actually Jim Miller mentioned this on the podcast you did with him, which I think it's exceptional by the way, and y'all should listen to it. Just search, ask a cycling coach podcast, Jim Miller. Um, I have, I typically have a checklist of things I want to accomplish in the first X amount of time in the race. If it's like 15 minutes or something else. So when I am in the zone, I'm just thinking about, I'm like literally in my head, just like, uh, so for example, one might be third wheel in the first turn after that it's clean this section after that it's sag this climb. So in my mind, I will be thinking through and saying those things over and over and over, over and over just focusing on them. So then when I get out on course, I can focus on those three things and that sets up the rest of the race for success. So those little like uh, early race checklists of things you want to accomplish that will put yourself in a good position to have a successful race. It's a very, very effective way to focus and to get rid of all the noise in the beginning of a race. Do you not talk on the start line, even if it's Leadville? <laughs> well, I, I did talk, uh, Sarah, when I did Leadville, it was right next to Sarah Sturm. And Sarah's, you know, happy, fun, uh, person, but so, I mean, we shared a couple words maybe, and that was it. After that, we were, <laughs> no, I don't talk like, what about in people... the middle of Leadville? Would you oh, say no something way. to someone? No, no okay. I do not talk at all. None. Like in a race. No, I'm no, I, yeah. And people have like told me, they're like, I, I can tell they're thinking like, wow, this Jonathan guy is not very friendly. Like what a jerk. I'm sorry. I just, I'm in the zone. I'm racing. Like I take it seriously. You know? yeah. All I can see is yeah. Dwight Schrute shunning and unshunning constantly. <laughs> I mean, Sarah Sturm, unshun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <Shun. Shun. laughs> uh, good reference, Chad. I like it. Uh, cool. Um, Chad, there's also one other thing that we wanted to cover on strength training. Something interesting that you found just mm. while perusing this week uh, mm. and looking mm-hmm. through different studies. Let's cover that. And then uh, we'll end up after that. We're going to get into a balanced question and then talk about strength training and that'll, and uh, that'll wrap up this podcast. But first, mm-hmm. uh, Chad share what you learned about, uh, I guess it is strength training as well. Uh, it's an interesting topic. Yeah, it is. Uh, <clears throat> so basically it revolves around caloric expenditure during strength training, which doesn't sound all that, uh, relevant to us, but, but bear with me. Cause it kind of is so new study, newish 2021. And I think they may have at least provided us with a somewhat useful strength training, energy expenditure heuristic. So to put it in another way, this gives us a way to find the quantify strength training calories. Uh, so the study is, uh, Joao and and colleagues, and they looked at oxygen consumption, lactate concentrations and energy expenditure. And they did it over three different strength training intensities, high, moderate, and low. And all we're going to focus on is the energy expenditure component of that. So uh, they, they all did 30 reps, regardless of which group they were in, which means for the high intensity, they did five uh, sets of six reps at 90%. Moderate did three by 10 at 75%. And then the low intensity, just a couple sets of 15 at 60%, all at the same tempo. So they didn't do it explosively. They didn't do it exceptionally slowly. They were all about a second and a half up, second and a half down, three second reps. So this is not a fixed rep workout because if you repeat 30 times of your 90% one rep max, that's going to be a heck of a lot more work than 30 times of your 60% one rep max. So, so really simply high intensity did more work than, than everybody. Moderate intensity did more work than low intensity. You get the idea. <clears throat> they kept it really basic. The exercises were chest press, pec deck, which is, you know, a pec fly on a machine, lat pull down, biceps, curls, triceps, extensions, squat, hamstring curl crunch machine. I mean, like the most basic, if you hire a personal trainer and this is what your personal trainer runs you through, you need to fire your personal trainer because you're (laughs) not going to get fit. So (laughs) as expected, the high intensity group had the highest energy expenditure values. Duh, they, they did more work. That's, that's to be expected, but interestingly, and perhaps not expected was that the low intensity group actually induced the greatest energy expenditure per unit time. So they burned more calories per minute, even though they were going at lower intensity. Reason being is that the high intensity group spent more time resting and that's the nature of it. If you work at a higher intensity, you, you require more rest before you can work at a higher intensity again. 
And this is kind of similar to, to what we face when we do longer recovery valleys during like uh, BO2 max or anaerobic interval workouts, and it, it drags down our average power, right? So, so we, we just spent more time resting. We did the same calories, right? But you know, same Watts, we, we, we still did the work, but time kind of dilutes what would you know, be those, those sexier, more impressive numbers. So the relevant findings here is that across all three of those intensities, the average energy expenditure came down to about six calories per minute. And almost all the participants fell between four to eight. So, you know, obviously they, they averaged it at eight or six, sorry, <clears throat> which doesn't, doesn't sound like a lot, right? Cause it's, it's 30 minutes. You're burned 180 calories, 45, 270, go for the whole hour, 360 calories. So minor takeaway is that, is that strength training's contribution to, to body composition and fat loss are probably not directly attributable to your in-session energy expenditure. Don't look at the calories you burn during a strength training session as being the driver for, for body comp changes. A, two cups of non-fat milk post, which is not a bad thing to follow a workout with, all but wipes away anything you may have accrued over six calories per minute for 30 minutes, right? It's gone. Yep. So, so not a, it's that, not a big not, burner. No, it's not. But for endurance athletes, strength training isn't about burning calories. That's, that's not why we're chasing. So the question is, why would we care about this, this new potential metric? How is this actually useful to us? What's its utility to us as endurance athletes? Well, a couple of things. First, if you're trying to match your nutrient intake to, to your workload, fueling the work, we talk about this all the time. Well, this, this assists you in doing so. If you know your basal metabolic rate, or you've estimated it, you know, what your you know, workout just consumed, you know, roughly what you're intaking, you know, that your body stays at this level when you do these things, but now you're introducing strength training. Well, you can put a little bit of a number on what it might take to fuel that additional work. Uh, similarly, if you're trying to, you know, ditch fat or just modify your body composition, maybe add a little muscle mass, this can actually, well, actually not. If you're trying to ditch fat, really, this can help you keep tabs on whatever deficit you're trying to maintain, be it 200, 300, 500 calories. This, this can, can help us quantify that. Now, let me, let me get to the caveats because I know people are going to be saying this is ridiculous. I can't, how, how can I possibly rely on this? This is a heuristic. Look up the word. It's not optimal. It's not perfect. It's not rational, but it's sufficient. So on average, six calories per minute was expended while strength training at various intensities in this workout, which probably carries, um, another caveat, this is typical. So traditional in, in terms of the weight training, I've already alluded to that. I mean, so many machines. So I think that uh, first off there's, there's tons of other ways to strength train, but I think just by removing the machines from the equation, you'll probably bump closer to seven to eight calories per minute doing, doing the same things, but doing them without the assistance of machines. And then let's, let's take it to the extreme side of things. And CrossFit usually fits this bill and within CrossFit, which tends to be probably the most metabolic way to, to move weights, the most in line with endurance demands and performance, uh, adaptations, a workout in particular. And I really thought on this one, and I, I can't think of one that's worse than this or, or more challenging than this is it's called Murph. And basically it, it pays homage to as so many of their workouts do to a fallen soldier. This one's Lieutenant Michael Murphy. You don a 20 or a 14 pound weight vest, run a mile, do hundred pull-ups, 200 push-ups, 300 air squats, you run another mile. So this is what in, in CrossFit parlance is termed a chipper. You know, you're not going to just run that mile and then drop down or jump up and do hundred pull-ups and then move on to your push-ups. Rather, you're going to do handful of pull-ups, handful of push-ups, handful of air squats, repeat until you knock them all out. Then you're going to go run. And I use run in the loosest sense of the term, because that last mile is, is not going to resemble running at all. You're going to survive that last hour. But the point is you're pretty legit if you can do this inside of an hour, vest right. or no vest. And, and I All promise right. you will exceed 360 calories over the course of that hour. That's a heck of a lot of work. So my point is be realistic when you're applying this heuristic that rhymed. Yeah. <laughs> One more caveat, work is work, work has consequences. So even though the energy expenditure is relatively low or may be relatively low, the toll on the body may not. So you have to consider this impact and not the caloric one when you're determining your strength training volume. You know, how many workouts are you going to do in a week? How many minutes is that workout going to comprise of? A couple of my uh, personal recommendations, you can get away with three times base training during, or I'm sorry, strength training during base, a couple times a week during build, one time a week during 
specialty, which is when you're in maintenance anyway, that is maintenance one time a week. And personally, I, I like to cap strength training workouts at 30 minutes. I mean, whatever takes place before the workout itself, the warm up, the mobility, the dynamic movement, whatever doesn't count toward that 30 minutes, but the strength training itself is 30 minutes. And I know there's a lot of downtime during those 30 minutes. So I'm not saying hit it fast and hard when you're trying to incur strength gains. So that 30 minutes is going to equate to not, not a ton of work, but so, so again, as endurance athletes, strength training, we're not, we're not concerned with burning calories. Our goals are to get stronger, to be more durable, to be more balanced, more mobile. We want to move better and we want to move stronger. And we want to do it both on and off the bike. So be clear on your objectives. Objectives. I like it. I also like this. Uh, it, so we typically tie in in our minds and the world, certainly the less performance oriented and scientifically based uh, folks will associate effort with calories, right? In the sense that like I worked really hard, had to have burned a lot of calories, <clears throat> but <laughs> calories, it, it's entirely <clears throat> based on the amount of work you can do, not how hard something felt it's all based off of work. And that's the, I mean, it's honestly just like, it's, it's a sad situation that exists and it's unfortunate, but like the, when you first start out, you can't burn many calories. And there are a lot of athletes there are a lot of people that look to, to, uh, shift body composition, lose weight, do that sort of thing with activity. And it's like, meanwhile, that 120 pound bantamweight little uh, cyclist can, burn so many more calories than the much larger person because they're just more trained to be able to do work. Right. So this is an important thing. Calories tie into how much work you're able to do and not just to the effort because strength training can feel really, really hard and it can leave you with doms. It can do all that stuff, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it puts you in a caloric deficit or something. Yeah. They're not the it's, best measure of the, the physiological toll. I mean, you can yeah. do, I've been doing 30 minute VO two max workouts and they crush me. They're hard. You, you, you can jam a lot of work into 30 minutes on the bike doing VO2 max or anaerobic yeah. and the caloric expenditure. I'm looking at maybe I'm, I'm lucky if I break 400 kilocalories, yeah. 400 KJs, but I can sit on the bike for an hour at 60%, 65% do something like Pettit or black, mm -hmm. you know, just aerobic endurance work. And I'm closer to 800 calories. But when I yeah. hop off the bike, I feel drastically different. And my body is, is in very, a very different state in terms of what it has to come back from. Yeah. And you'll notice that on trainer road, you'll look at every workout will tell you how many calories or how many kilojoules are, or will be expended as you do the ride as prescribed. Uh, it's really helpful for being able to like plan things out and make sure, making sure you're nourishing yourself. So, you know, I, I, I pitched that in the circumstance of like, oh, strength training doesn't burn as many calories. Bummer. But also let's flip this Our VO2 work doesn't burn as many calories as you thought. Bummer. Let's flip it on the other side. This is why you need to fuel those endurance workouts that don't feel that hard. Keep in mind, if you're feeling with hundred grams an hour of carbs, that's roughly 400 calories that you're taking in. Like Chad just said, that's a VO2 workout. If you do pet it, that might be double that. So when we talk about nourishment, it's really, really hard to nourish yourself and it's so easy for us to just think, well, hard effort means I need to nourish myself. No, you just need to nourish yourself. Like the effort isn't the qualifier. You just need to nourish yourself. So uh, side point from this, but super important one. Um, okay. Let's and get a reminder. Oh, yeah. oh I was just going to say, and a reminder why we need to, when exercising fuel intellectually, not based on feeling. Oh yeah. Or else we'll always end up in a hole, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Imagine going through like BWR San Diego that you did last year and you did so well at, and like, imagine just going through and be like, yeah, whatever. When I'm hungry, I think I'll eat. Like you would have not been in a battle on the last climb with Katarina at all. You know? Yeah. So. I was like eating out of fear in that race. Yeah. I kept looking at my power and I was like, oh gosh, I better eat something else. Emotional eating <laughs> on the bike. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's like the mouth of the funnel is like real is, is not getting wider, but the bottom of the funnel's real big. Like it's just dumping right through. I need to put more in. Right. So yeah. 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 Uh, okay. Oscar says, first of all, I want to congratulate the whole trainer road team. I've been using it for more than two years and the improvements are amazing. The AI FTP detection is crazy. It just works perfect. And I've been more fit now. And I, that I have been, and I have been more consistent since adaptive training arrived. Good to hear Oscar. Way to go. It's exciting stuff. Um, from Ivy, uh, from community management to our customer support folks, to all of our engineers and designers and our product managers. Thanks to all of you, uh, for all the great work you've done. You're helping Oscar get faster. Could help you too. Go to trainerroad.com. sign up, give it a shot. 
Uh, okay. It says I got injured in, in September of last year and now I'm on my highest FTP ever. And I feel great on and off the bike. Way to go with those improvements. A question came to mind. I started strength training three times per week, full body. And he says, eight to 12 reps, three to four sets each exercise. So that's like not, you know, that's pretty typical for what we would see for cyclists doing strength training. Right, Chad. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, he says, and this isn't the sort of strength training you're doing when you're trying to like boost, like, you know, one rep max and vanity stuff, you know, the eight to 12, isn't exactly going to accomplish that. Instead, it's going to make a strong, capable humans. That's what we're looking for. After my injury, I, and, and I, he says, I have noticed that anaerobic workouts seem really easy now. And he mentions that he's on the specialty phase. So usually I rate them easy or moderate. And usually the jumps between the workouts are 0.8 to 1.2 on, on the progression levels. VO2 max are still hard, but not as hard as before. And threshold over unders are still a nightmare for me. <laughs> Hopefully last week's podcast can help with that. We talked about over unders. I was wondering if there is a relationship between strength training and anaerobic workouts on the bike. Does strength training help to improve the side on the bike or is there not a direct relation between those? Again, you guys are amazing. So thank you, Oscar. And before we get into answering this one, I want to address one thing. First of all, because of his specialty phase, I bet that we're not trying to, so this is going to explain a bit of the inner workings behind how the plans work. Um, depending on your, the day that you have on your plan, there are different intentions with that specific day. Uh, because you can make you can swap the days around and move everything around. I'll just say like day one, day two, and day one, day two, and day three of a low volume plan. One might be a day in which we really want to improve your abilities. Another day might be one where we don't want to improve your abilities. And instead we just want to keep you, you know, keep your stasis going. And then another one might be where we want to stretch your abilities and push you even further. Right. So it all depends. And as a result, sometimes you'll be doing anaerobic workouts. And in this case, like Oscar, you might be marking them easy. So you'd think that like, okay, well then why aren't I really moving up? Why isn't adaptive training going? Okay. Well, in that case, boom, moving way up on well, the specialty phase, the goal isn't to really drive up your abilities so much as to make sure that you are refined and ready and able uh, for your event when it comes. And that's why, uh, that's probably why he's marking them easy. So anyways, that's how that works. wanted to clarify that. And it's cool because now when you look at your training plan, you'll understand why some weeks you'll be like, you know, I marked it easier, moderate. Why isn't it jumping me up even faster? Because maybe that's not a relative or a relatable objective for your goals. So an adaptive training knows the difference. It's super smart. Uh, okay. So Chad, there's kind of like this assumption here or an assumption about this relationship of strength training, helping these maybe higher VO2 and then up from there in intensity. So anaerobic and sprint efforts. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts on that from <clears throat> does strength training make those efforts better? And if so, how, or make you better at those efforts? And if so, what's actually going on that makes you better at those efforts? Yeah, so, uh, I think it's just a matter of strength training, making every effort better. It's just a little more evident when you're working as hard as you are, when you're doing VO2 max and anaerobic work. So you just become a better rider. You just have a stronger body. You're, you're hemorrhaging less energy movement because you become more refined. You're better at pushing on the pedals and not suffering power losses in other parts of the body that move because you don't push on the pedal pedals very well or in a very controlled manner. I do think this is, this is just one of the, maybe not unintended, but less celebrated benefits of strength training is you just get better at stuff in general, you, you're just better at riding the bike. And again, it becomes more prevalent when you're doing things that are hard, when you're really taxing the muscular system as much as you can in an endurance sport, something that's more reliant on metabolic turnover and not so much muscular force capabilities. So it, it the, the translation from, uh, strength training to the closest equivalent in endurance training, the anaerobic side, or even the sprint side is never, it's, it's still not going to be as clear as, as people I think want to make it. If I, if I can push a bunch of weight in the gym, I should be able to push the pedals harder. And yeah, to some degree that, that does carry, but we're still talking the difference between strength, which is force production and endurance, which is energy turnover, that these things will never perfectly align or even very closely align this. These are just benefits of strength training. And again, you see them because you're working hard, but you'll also see them if you back it off a bit and you have to ride for five hours when your longest ride used to be three hours yet magically now you're getting through five hours without the same aches and pains 
where you can work at threshold and do, you know, a 40 K time trial in four minutes less. And, you know, maybe even at the same power, just because you're not wasting power in ways that, that manifest because your body just doesn't work as cohesively as it does when it's stronger. Mm -hmm. uh, Ivy, what do you feel in terms of like benefits on the bike when you are doing strength training? Yeah. Um, man, I think about this all the time in the beginning of the season, uh, when I first start integrating really hard efforts and there's such a stark difference between when I didn't used to do strength training and would try to jump into those efforts and how horrible it felt the first, <laughs> you know, few weeks that I was doing them versus, um, doing strength training now, uh, and, there's so much significance and familiar familiarity for me, um, where, mm. uh, you know, a lot of the lifts that I do at much higher reps. Um, so like 15 or twenties in some cases, I feel a direct correlation when I'm doing, um, like sprint efforts, for example, where I feel I'm more able to use more muscle recruitment of my entire body in the later part of those efforts, because it feels so familiar from doing that weight training to that degree with higher, higher reps. Um, does that make sense? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cause it, so there's not, this like, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah. So it's not like those things that I'm doing make me, you know, from a physiological standpoint, a better sprinter. Um, mm -hmm. I might be able to put out a little more power, but it just makes I just feel like it helps me, um, prepare to better, um, know what it feels like and, uh, recruit my muscles in a different way at a, when, when stuff gets harder, longer. That kind of goes against like the bro science, logical conclusion that we have in our minds, right? Hannah of like, well, if I lift muscles, I get, or if I lift weights, I get big muscles and big muscles would help me really push down on those pedals hard. Like Chad said, and it's really not about hypertrophy or like, you know, increasing the amount of muscle mass in terms of, you know, circumference of your biceps and your quadriceps. That's not really the goal, right, Hannah? Right. And I think that should be really encouraging to people who haven't done a lot of strength training in the past, because, um, I think that, I think it's something like the first 12 weeks of strength training is primarily neuromuscular gains. And I feel like those neuromuscular gains are what serve me the best on the bike, uh, which is maybe also why, like Ivy said, when I first start strength training for the year, I'm like, Whoa, look at this increase. <laughs> um, and then, I mean, obviously you continue to have that and more, but it's just so noticeable, uh, when you first start. So yeah, I would, I would second that. I feel this neuromuscular connection, like my body is doing what my mind asked me to do, asks me to do, which is also coordination. I feel more, muscle fiber recruitment. Um, and I just feel more durable, uh, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like, which to me equates to efficiency, you know, instead of almost, instead of power dissipating, maybe through some slight knee movements or upper body movements, I feel so much more stable. Like I can truly push every muscular effort is going straight into that pedal. Mm. I'm feeling that even with, uh, with doing more running now and swimming and everything else, just getting a stronger body. Cause, uh, man, I'm feeling planted on the bike, comfortable, mm -hmm. like capable, stable. Uh, I don't feel like I'm wishy-washy. One thing that I noticed too, is that when I've been doing strength training and really diligently, and if I start to taper off on that, I also taper off on this ability to be able to consciously and actively fire certain muscle groups or make them perform like I want. So, uh, glutes turning off is a really common thing. Like your glutes are not as involved in the pedal stroke as they should be. And then what happens is your quadriceps tend to take up the, the brunt of the work. And with a cyclist, typically our lateral quadriceps. So those outside quad muscles, they are the ones that end up taking the brunt of the work that pulls on your knees a little weird. Uh, that creates this chain of instability that then causes a lot of problems all because, you know, your glutes aren't firing very well. And it's because we sit down with them turned off and we don't really use them a whole lot. <clears throat> when you strength train and you're doing, you know, exercises that go on to trainer roads blog, and you can find a ton of different resources, go onto our YouTube 
uh, page trainer or youtube.com slash trainer road. And you can see different strength training exercises that we recommend when you do those, it forces you to fire those muscles. And when you do that, it builds those connections. So then when you're on the bike and you're like, Hey, I'm not firing appropriate appropriately, you simply think of it and you start doing it and you, and it happens. Whereas sometimes if you aren't doing strength training, you have to get off the bike, do like, you know, glute activation exercises and try to do that. stuff just to restore those connections. And then you hope it lasts on the bike. It's just, it's such a great insurance program for athletes to avoid injury and to be able to build proper technique and sprinting really, you know, I, I don't know how to really measure this, but I think more, there's more to sprinting in terms of like coordination is more to blame for successful sprinting than just pure force creation. Uh, and I think that that's evident by the fact that rarely a sprint is won by the initial surge of power, but the athlete's ability to sustain that power, right? That's where you see athletes. And typically what it looks like is instead of an athlete sustaining it and, and accelerating away from the field, it's just everybody else can't sustain it quite as much. So they end up dropping back, it makes that rider look like they're accelerating ahead, but in many cases they don't. It's that ability to be able to fire the muscles all at the right pattern. Like Chad said, you have, you have agonists and antagonists and they're not fighting each other. Instead, they're working perfectly in unison. And when that happens, it's really efficient. You know, we had Justin Williams on the podcast and what did he say about how he's so good at sprinting practice? He said that he has sprinted endless amounts of times his whole life. That's just what he has done all the time. And you look at Corey and you look at Justin and how good they are at sprinting, probably a brotherly rivalry of sprinting against each other all the time doing stuff, you know, and that's the sort of thing that really builds that ability to, to go fast on the bike. So Oscar on those efforts, those require a huge amount of neuromuscular coordination the higher in intensity you go or the longer things get drawn out, the more important that becomes. So that's likely where you're seeing, that's likely why you're seeing the most benefit there. It's probably comes down to coordination rather than just building big muscles. So kind of a sneaky, sneaky gain that you're getting from, from strength training. It could also be a sign of needing to work on that threshold, um, and below mm -hmm. a little bit more, just, it makes me think, and be curious what Oscar's cadence is for some of those efforts. You know, if he's putting it, if he's standing for all of his anaerobic work or doing a really low cadence, that makes it more muscular versus then if he sits and spins at 90 RPMs during the threshold, it's a very different type of effort and requires more cardiovascular, um, uh, load. Mm -hmm. So it's just different and, and it's not good, not bad. It's just a data point to know, okay, these are my areas of opportunity. Yeah, for sure. That's a good point. Looking like everything feels really easy here. Maybe the negative space speaks more volumes, right? So, mm -hmm. and honestly, the one thing I can say is with strength training, that's one of the, one of the most immediate ways that I recognize the improvement is in sweet spot and sustained work. And I think it comes down to once again, that efficiency, like I'm not flopping around, you know, mm -hmm. it's just easier to be able to sustain that. Like one way I always think of this too, is if you're riding a VO two max and your pedaling technique changes substantially when you're a VO two max versus when you're at threshold, it's probably not sustainable from many different reasons. But even if just, if we want to isolate one reason, it's because you're not pedaling efficiently when you get up to VO two max, right? If you're just flopping your body around and you're pedaling with your ears instead of just in from a solid foundation pelvis anchored or the sit bones anchored to the saddle and you're able to produce that power well of course you wouldn't be able to sustain that for long periods of time right and the same thing goes with threshold so <clears throat> check your technique on that for sure that's a great point hannah um, chances are you have the strength to be able to do it but sometimes we lack the discipline to be able to sustain and actually utilize all that strength so any other points you want to cover on this one, y'all? <clears throat> cool. So. We're it's gonna get in. Yeah. <laughs> Way to go, Ivy. Yes, <laughs> it's good for you. Yeah, um, Ivy. Do you have any other races planned coming up soon, or do you want a sneaky race again? Because you totally sneaky raced that Criterium this past weekend. Uh, yeah, I didn't. I didn't. Well, I don't know if I wanted to race. We talked about early season races pretty recently on a podcast, and how I uh -huh. usually don't do them because of how 
emotionally damning they are for me to just get rolled. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't yeah. planning on racing, but this race in Sacramento is kind of a NorCal classic and training's mm -hmm. been going good and I was feeling snappy. So I was like, oh, uh, all right, fine, I'll do it. And, um, what'd you learn? In. Cause you won, um, which by the way, awesome. Thanks. Uh, way to go Ivy. Po you. Everyone in the podcast world is clapping for you right now. <laughs> Are we talking yeah. about land park? Yeah. 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 Nice. yeah. Uh, one so of our fun. favorite courses, uh, Chad, I bet you the Chad, do you like that course as well? I've never mm -hmm. really, yeah. It's yeah. a power course. Yeah. yeah. It's not very technical. Yeah. It's fun, huh? And there's a lot of different tactics that can unfold on it. Cause it has a few different like key elements that really change it up. Mm -hmm. yeah. What'd you learn Ivy? Uh, or what did you enjoy? A lot, a lot actually. Um, yeah. which is that it doesn't matter that I've been removed from actual crit racing for what, like three or four years or more that I'm, uh, just getting smarter as I get older, <laughs> I feel like five or six or seven or eight years ago. Um, if I would roll up to a crit like that, um, especially in this time of training, I would have tried to force a break. I would have gone for, um, like every preem and would have gotten rolled in the end for sure. Um, and so I, uh, I'm stoked that I was able to, uh, kind of roll the dice a few times and see where I was at and see where everyone else was at and what kind of course it was. And if it was a breakaway course and what I could do and actually look at it and critically think about it in the race and respond accordingly. That what was, was the strategy, Ivy? What ended up working? So, um, I, because I'm so out of practice with mm -hmm. crits and I didn't know how my legs were and I didn't know any of these people I was racing with, I was like, okay, I'm going to get uh, the first preem, uh, just to see how my legs are and remind myself who I am. Uh, and there was one on the first lap. So that was great. And it went great. And so I was like, okay, it's good. Um, uh, it's a good day. And it was super windy and the course is pretty open with the exception of like a tricky little chicane. So I was like, okay, this could potentially be a breakaway course. And everyone was super willing to, uh, attack a lot and try to force a break. And so I was like, okay, it could happen. And there are a few teams with a couple riders. So it, um, it's not unlikely by any means. Um, so I followed a few and kind of bridged up to a couple in the first, I don't know, like five or six laps and it just wasn't working and it was so windy. Um, and the field was too motivated to not let anything go that they didn't like. So it just wasn't going to work. So then my strategy had to just be to, um, figure out who the sprinters were kind of like sit back and watch them go for preems and figure out where to be in the end and just be patient. Nice way yeah. to go. Those mid race, those mid race, uh, strategy course corrections are kind of tough to do sometimes, right? Because we get married to an idea of how a race is going to play out and it's tricky to like sit back and say, actually, I'm going to observe what's going on and change that. <laughs> yeah. Hard. Good on you for seeing that early on and just, you know, I'm guessing. So for the middle part of the race, you sat in and played it a little more conservatively totally. Totally. Yeah. and then yeah. it came down to a bunch sprint mm -hmm. field sprint. Yeah. And, uh, that was so tricky and so hairy because of how windy it was. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, being a little out of practice and maybe you should have been a little bit farther back when it's super windy, you can make the mistake of, um, and I did thinking I need to be like second or third or fourth wheel, expecting it to be like a traditional sprint where oh, those yeah. people in front will really wind it up and carry a lot of speed and I'll be able to pop around them. But because it was so windy, they lost so much speed and we all got swarmed. And all of a sudden there were like four or five riders to the left in the draft, like that had already passed me. And I was like, whoops, well, here we go. And just kind of had to weave through them and really wind it up and <laughs> somehow got past them. Yeah. Just superior power. Then you didn't even latch onto them. You just sprinted against them and beat a train yeah. of four. Yeah. I had to just like kind <laughs> of sneak, to go. sneak through them <laughs> awesome. and try to nice. find another gear and somehow did. <laughs> yeah. I know this doesn't matter at all. And I know that you weren't going for this, but I saw a picture of you on the race. Everyone should go follow Ivy on Instagram, uh, by the way, uh, go check that out. Um, I think it was on your Instagram. Maybe it was on your stories. You just look like a bike racer. Like it's so cool. Like, <laughs> like, uh, I, when I look at myself in a bike race, I don't always think like, yeah, that looks like a bike racer, but like every photo I see of Ivy racing, I'm like, dang, like 
that looks cool. Like, yeah, it was, it was just awesome. There's a picture of you like going through a turn and then like riders behind you. And it just looks, it okay, looks that's awesome. on the main right now. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank, that was thanks, super John. cool. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so like, uh, companies, if you're looking for models to make your stuff look like real cyclists are using <laughs> it, Ivy looks like is the most real of real cyclists. It's pretty cool. So, thank you, uh, Ivy. Sorry if I just pitched you for modeling gigs that you absolutely do not want. Um, <laughs> um, okay, I want to have a discussion. So there are a lot of different uh, questions that came in here in the states. Everyone switched daylight saving time this past weekend. Switch to it, uh, and somehow that's become political these days. So we're just going to leave that there, and instead we're going to get into a discussion on what this means for your training. We've had a lot of people ask questions about like, uh, well, what does um, how can I follow my plan since now I'm going to be riding outside more often? How do I balance it or uh, what do I do with all these group rides that are happening after work now? There's a ton of different questions that we've been getting this week. So I want to generally cover a handful of things. And we're going to go into pro tips on how to train outside, uh, from Hannah, from Ivy, from Chad, myself, everything else. We're just going to talk about different things that we can think can help. Um, and spoiler alert with trainer road outside workouts, you can do all of your training outside, which is pretty darn cool. I do probably, I don't know last year. I had to have done over 90% of my training outside. Um, uh, I'm fortunate in the spot where I live, where I have a lot of access to roads. I think that really helped with it, but it's foreshadowing. We'll get into that in just a bit, but first, okay. So how to fit in your training with an increased number of unstructured rides. So whether it's group rides that are happening, mountain bike rides that you want to go do coffee shop rides, fun rides, big, long weekend rides, whatever it is, <clears throat> how do you do it? So first tip, maybe drop down in training volume. And that's really easy to do when you use trainer road and you pick a training volume, there's low, mid and high. Uh, when you go into your calendar, you can see wherever that training block that you're currently in, wherever it starts, there'll be a little annotation that says what the plan is and where you're at. Click on that and you can change the volume right there. It's super easy. Um, so maybe dry dropping in volume. So you're still getting in structure because structure is still key and important, but then that allows you to get in all the other sort of training that you want to do. The other thing that you could do as well is you, if you don't feel like you need a plan to build toward a specific goal, you just want structure, but you really just want to be able to ride and do all that stuff is switch to train. Now you can remove your plan, but then use train. Now train. Now will look at the workouts you've been doing outside. It'll look at the IF it'll look at the duration. And then based on that, it will recommend which structured work you should do, uh, which is really cool. So it's using a lot of adaptive training to give you those workouts, but consider it like a drop-in. You just drop in, you can get a workout that's going to be recommended for you. It'll be an endurance one, a climbing one, which is sustained efforts or attacking, which is short, intense efforts. Uh, so that's a great option too. And that way you can keep up on structure throughout the year, because there's so many people that tell us I'm flying in the spring. And then in the summer, they're like, I don't know what happened. All that fitness must've been brittle fitness. And it's like, well, you didn't train, do any structure from, you know, April all the way until August. So of course <laughs> that's what happens when you don't do structure. Um, the other thing that you can do is, and this is kind of in complimentary with this, because if a lot of people just, you want to ride outside, that's why we ride bikes, do outside workouts. So any workout that's on your calendar, you can flip a switch and it takes it from an inside workout to an outside workout. You just click outside. It's that simple. If you don't have a power meter, then you can click RPE and it will give you the interval targets in terms of RPE. If you do have a power meter, it just pushes right over to your Garmin or your Wahoo head unit. And then when you start it up and your head unit sinks, it'll say today's workout is this. Do you want to do it? And you'll hit yes. And it's like literally that simple. It's super cool. Then trainer road after the fact will associate that workout with that ride market is completed. You just have to go back in and fill out the survey for that ride to tell us how hard it was. Super cool. Coming soon, adaptive training is going to analyze those outside rides in depth. It's already doing it, but it will actually end up showing the results in your product because um, we're training it obviously to do these things. So I want to cover some basics on outside workouts and how to make them better. Because since we can't really control that experience with trainer road, we wish that we could make it like perfect and even better. And, but we can't because we don't own your head units and all that stuff. So there are some tips that I want to cover on this. And then we're going to get into tips on how we all execute. So there's a fantastic blog article on this. And I bet Jesse's going to link to it and even support or forgive me, uh, help center articles on this about how to set up your screens on your head unit. They can really help. So, uh, there are some basic tips. Uh, one of the, the, my Garmin screen, the way I have it for training is I have time to go 
And if you have a newer Garmin, you'll have this option. So I have time to go. That tells me how much time I have left in my interval. Then I have my power target and it gives you a range. It always gives you probably a 20 watt range is what you'll deal with. And we specifically do that to allow you flexibility. So then you're not obsessing over holding a specific power target the whole time when you're outside, because that's kind of hard. Then I have my power smooth to whatever duration I want. I picked, I use 10 second smoothing when I'm outside. Um, I know that probably is going to upset a lot of people for some strange reason, uh, heart rate, cadence, and then my lap power. And that's what I have on there. So with all that information, you've basically got the trainer road workout screen on your Garmin and it's a really helpful way to look at it. Um, but I want to talk about safety and pacing. So Hannah, what are your, like, so uh, you mentioned this too, that you have a lot of people talk about like, how in the world do I hold my power targets outside? And how do I do all this? What are your thoughts on suggestions to help people without when they're trying to do interval training outside? Do you have any tips or best practices that you could share? Yeah, I think it's a, a general misnomer that if you have interval workout, you have to do it indoors. You certainly can. It creates a really controlled environment, but outdoors is really fun. Um, and so I think that switching it up can also help prevent some burnout and things like that. And just having options to be able to do either is great. So I think it's important to know that you can do any workout outside. If you want to, it's just a matter of finding the places that match that workout profile. Well, so, you know, I think the first thing that can be misunderstood is thinking that you have to have, you know, a perfect loop that has five minute climb and then the five minute rest that you need. And then another five minute climb, it doesn't <laughs> have to match the profile of your workout. If you have five minute intervals, all you need is a five minute stretch of road. Um, and that might not sound super exciting, but to me, it's still fun because I can measure how far I'm going, you know, all of these different things. And I can do those intervals on that one stretch of road. It feels super safe because I know that stretch I've selected it specifically for that interval. You know, that means there's not, um, stoplights or a lot of cars. There's probably a big shoulder, all of those type of things. And then after that, I can go and do, you know, the rest of my ride somewhere else, finish out the loop, warm up, cool down somewhere more exciting and fun. Um, but I think the big thing is just finding that road that matches your intervals well and selecting a place that it is safe and it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be back and forth and that's fine. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a steady climb, right? Like it can be a flat section. It can be rolling. I think there's a lot to be said with learning how to put out power when the terrain is rolling too. Mm -hmm. We're not saying like severe where it's like you're spinning out or you're out of gears and it's like really, you know, crazy steep up and down, but there's a lot to be said for that. One of the things that I always admired about Chad when I started racing was the fact that like Chad could just like motor through sections. And especially when it would go downhill, Chad would just motor away from me because I was so used to just holding, like Chad was used to holding 300 Watts up a hill and down a hill, like it was nothing. And, and I don't care who you are, 300 Watts down a hill feels harder than 300 Watts up a hill. It's just how it works. I don't know if it's something broken in our brains or what the deal is, but that's just how it is. And, but it's really good to do that because in race scenarios and everything else, you're not going to have the opportunity for perfect pacing. It will be adjusted. Um, even like smart trainers tend to kind of, uh, report smooth data. When you look at it, it's smoother than the reality is. And if you use trainer road with a power meter and a smart trainer, there's a feature called power match, which will actually show your power from your power meter. As you go throughout this, it's super cool. And you'll notice that when you do that versus just using a smart trainer, it looks like it changes a whole lot more. And it's actually just realistic power. That's just what it is. Like we never get the chance to just perfectly hold our power. It's always going to undulate. It's always going to adjust. So I think that there's a realistic circumstance that's uh, that can be really helpful when you're talking about race day performance or meaningful yes. day performance. If you're not a racer, it can really help with that. That's exactly what I was going to say is even if you're someone who loves the trainer and that's actually what you prefer, I would still challenge you to get out every now and then and still complete a workout outside because most of us, we race outside. And so it comes down to that specificity again, of knowing how to put out power when you're doing things like balancing and holding yes. a line on your own. And the key is structure. Don't let your structure drop and don't 
Cause there's this weird association. A lot of us have built up that like structure equals indoors. Mm-hmm. And then when I'm outside, no structure and don't do that. Like structure is what makes you fast. So like, mm-hmm. don't get rid of that. You can, you can have your cake and eat it in this case. It's awesome. Yes. So you can do all of the above. I want to talk about, so like the question came in this week, somebody was asking like, how do you hold your power target when you're riding outside? And they were mentioning the fact, like, how do I do it safely? Cause I'm just staring at my head unit. Um, and <laughs> Ivy's eyes just got huge. No, I also just think about athletes that, um, you know, fixate on differences of like four Watts. And I'm Total like, differences. how do you, I can't, I can't do that. Like, I can't be like, I'm going to do exactly 255 Watts. Like, no, it'll be 250 or 258 or 260. Like it's so hot. I, I just, I don't get it. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it also doesn't matter. Alex yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. That's what I wanted yeah. to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, I mean, how do you do that, Hannah, when you're locking into, when you have uh, power targets, when you're doing it? Do you stare at your screen the whole time? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I always have a range. I think yeah. that's number one is I'm never just shooting for exactly one number. Not only does it not matter. I mean, your body, your body doesn't know. Um, and if you think of the energy systems and you think about the workout that you're trying to complete, you're trying to be in a zone or a range or a system, you know, sweet spot and threshold, all of those things are within a certain range. So first of all, picking a range makes it a lot easier mentally. And then it's just glancing up and glancing down, you know, once you dial in and you know what that number feels like, you shouldn't be, you won't be deviating so greatly that you need to fixate on it and stare at it. You recognize what it feels like. So you glance down, you see, okay, this is what that pace feels like. And then you can look up and complete your effort. And you just glance down every now and then to make sure that you're not fatiguing and falling below that. You're not checking to make sure that every pedal stroke is on that. You're just making sure that you're maintaining that. Yeah. It's about tying in perception and power, right? Mm -hmm. Like what I typically do and with every outside workout that you'll find in trainer road, during that warm up, you'll have the latitude to be able to work your way up to whatever power you'll be holding during the main interval sets. So let's just say it's 220 Watts. And that's what you're going to be doing during your intervals. You'll be able to go up to 220 and see what that feels like and be like, okay, roughly that's what it feels like today. Then when you start your intervals, you start out and shoot for that feeling, check in after 15 seconds or so, see where you're at or 10 seconds, whatever it might be. And when I say check in, it's just a glance down, look down at it and be like, oh, okay, that's where I'm at. And then just make those adjustments. But I find that the higher the intensity, the more I'll glance down. Um, and when I say the more I'll glance down, it'll be like every 10 seconds or something, you know, 15 seconds, I'll like look down and see 30 seconds, something like that. Like yesterday's VO two intervals that I did outside, I was looking down every like 30 to 45 seconds, but after about 15 seconds, I checked in and I was like, yep, okay, I'm close. Or I need to go up or I need to go a little down. And then after that, I just check in every 45 seconds or so. If I'm doing steady state work, that's lower in intensity, like a long tempo ride where I just need to ride at, you know, like 70%, 76%, something like that right there, I can look down every 10 minutes, maybe I'll glance then because I just, that feeling is what I'm trying to hold. And once again, sorry, Chad, for making you blush, but Chad's mentioned this ad nauseum and it's such a great point, but data shouldn't override perception. It should inform perception. And that's one thing that you really get with outside workouts. That's super cool when you combine that with training on the trainer too, because you train on the trainer and you'll be locked into that and you can really get a feel for what it is. And then you get outside. And if you work on tying that in, Oh, it makes you a weapon when it comes to racing, because then you're really in tune with what your body's feeling and where its limits are. And it's just a really powerful tool. It can, it can help a ton. So don't have to stare at it, just glance and tie in feeling. Yeah. There's not a lot of benefit in trying to micromanage your power output anyway. I mean, we smooth the data and, and for, for maybe a number of reasons and yeah, it does make it look prettier, but physiologically it's more representative of what's actually going on. If we didn't smooth it, and we saw, you know, you have a target 255 Watts when really you're dancing between 235 and 275 at any point. And it's just up and down, up and down, up and down. And you're thinking, <laughs> oh my God, the benefit down at 235 is very different from the benefit up at 275. And this, this workout can't possibly be uh, uh, bringing about, you know, uh, achieving 
what I need it to achieve at 255 Watts. It's that's not the way the body works. It's, mm-hmm. but the, the smooth data is probably more closely in line with what's taking place physiologically. So yep. trying to nail something perfectly is already a fool's errand. And then on top of it, using the data to tell you that you're nailing it is another one. You need to be able to feel what it's like to stay in what, what, you know, both of you, both of our, uh, Ivy and Hannah have described is, is a narrow band, but it's not, it's not 255 Watts. It's going to dance below and above it and just, just be close enough most of the time. And this is why we normalize power. This is why we average power because you can't, mo- you can't modulate it that closely and get it that spot on for even a couple seconds at a time. Yeah. And I want to be clear on one thing too. When Chad says we smooth it, it's not saying trainer road does anything unique, Everybody. but it's why we have average, average power, normalized power, or why we view our power in terms of three seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds, whatever smoothing you have, unless you're Alex wild and you do one second. Once again, you're a robot. I don't know how Alex does it. Um, so, um, but that's why, uh, we do that. We don't do anything unique here at trainer road with that. And it's something you get better at with time, right? Hannah, like at first expect, especially when people get a power meter at first, they're like, what does this number mean? It's like bouncing all over the place but you get better at pacing with time, right? Yeah. And I would also encourage everyone to have that lap interval on their cycling computer, um, whether it's lap average power or lap normalized power, depending on what type of interval you're doing. But if you're just trying to make that three second, five second, 10 second power be the number the whole time, it is a fool's errand. Um, Mm -hmm. But if you're Try, if you're looking at that lap average power, that should just help your mind relax a little bit because as that number is jumping around, you'll realize it's not really impacting your average power for that interval that much. That average power is not jumping around. So you'll realize that it's not, it's not as difficult as it could seem. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, go give it a shot go to trainerroad.com, sign up. If you have big events, put adaptive training to the test. Uh, you totally should just go there, sign up for it, see how it works. You can do all those workouts outside. If you're training right now and you have more outside workouts, drop down to a low volume plan, maybe switch to train now, but don't stop doing structure. Stick with us. You will get faster. I promise you. And you'll maintain your speed throughout the season. It's the way to do it. It's what all pros do too. They don't just completely ditch structure. They are doing structure throughout the season. It's what makes you faster. We don't have yeah. to train anymore. <laughs> yes, exactly. Summer vacation. Uh, if you want to stay fast, don't stop doing structure. That's the way. That's what we see across the board. So thanks everybody for joining us for this episode. It's been an awesome one. Super informative. Chad, it's great to have you as always. Thanks for, for coming on. Hannah, thanks Ivy. For having me. Go to trainerroad.com, share this podcast with your friends. Once again, go rate it on Spotify. And also you can share this podcast from Spotify. There's a share button. It's super easy. It just shares straight to Instagram. So if you're listening to this and you appreciated this episode, I want all of you to go on there and share it on Instagram. That would be awesome. It's a great way to help us grow. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks y'all. Thanks. Thanks everybody.